You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Anthony Canucci. Anthony, how are we, brother? Yeah, yeah you fucked it up already. Yeah, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Gaucci. Gaucci, there you go. Yeah. This, um, good to have you on. Thanks for having me. You, re- you wrote the book, Mafia Made. Right. You weren't in the Mafia. No. You supplied drugs to the Mafia. Is that correct? Y- yeah. Yeah. And it, Well, a friend of mine had uh, some pretty good connections in Colombia and... Uh, you know, a lot of people say that the, the mafia is not involved in drugs. Well, that's, you know, it's just not true. So there was a, a lot of a lot of uh, drug dealing going on in the mafia, and uh, especially through the cartel. So You've seen a lot of bad shit from a young age. Yeah. But we'll go right back to the start. I always go back to the start of my guess. Get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Mm-hmm. I'll, you want to go back to, like, right the back. beginning? Yeah, to the, right okay. Back, brother. Well... My my dad, he, he was from New York here, and started uh, in New York. He was doing a little bit of loan sharking, right? And in New York, you've got rules. You know, you've got to be with this family or that family. You're going to pay. And they were never, you know, they didn't want to do that. My f- grandfather came from Italy. I'm like, yeah. So they ended up going down to Florida because Florida was known to be open. You, know, you could do whatever you want down there. There's a lot of mobsters went down to South Florida. A lot of people don't realize how powerful South Florida was. Everyone thinks, ah, New York, Chicago. Florida, all the gangsters go down there anyway because they're freezing their nuts off. Look how cold it is outside now. So they go down to Florida, and they got a rule that's open. You could do whatever you want. These families are working with this one. These guys are doing this, and no one's really watching what's going on. So there's a lot of, a lot of drugs. Um, so at the age of, as far as I can remember, I was five. My dad used to take me. He used to go. He was a contractor, painting contractor. And all he would do was go from bar to bar to bar. That was it. There was no... And in the bars, everything was going on. You met all the people. He got all the work. And, you know, I'm introduced to this guy. And I'm not, I don't know who's who or what's what. I'm only five years old. And uh, I'm making drinks. I'm getting 20s. I'm getting 50s. Every time I go, I'm getting, I'm coming home with a couple hundred dollars doing nothing. There was a friend of ours, uh, Dick Byram, George, George Byram, who we would, it was a family friend. He'd take us to the Bahamas. He'd get a boat. He'd go to Bimini. And one day I was at a bar with my dad. I think it was the Moose, Moose Club. I think that was the name of that. I found out later that was the name. And I go to the bathroom. I'm, you know, I'm up against the urinal. And I, someone comes in. Bob, boom. I fuck scares the shit out of me. And I'm looking. And someone's getting a beating. They're, they're throwing a beating on someone. So I'm over there just staring straight. And uh, I take a look after they go, and it's Dick, 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 the friend of ours, and he's they beat him good. He's got blood on him. I'm like, oh geez. I look over. There's a guy holding the door, and he goes, "Hey, kid, go go grab some paper towels." So I run over to the bar, tell my dad what happens. He goes, "I'll go to the closet, grab some grab some stuff, and help him out clean up." So we're cleaning up, da, 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 and Dick's on the floor. He's like fucked up. He's little eyeballs hanging out. No, <laughs> his tooth, his tooth is, he's, he's, he's bad. And he's like, I'm sorry, kid. And I'm like, what are you sorry for? He goes, I got blood on your shoes. And I'm like, ah, but don't, don't worry. The guy tells me, get, the, you got blood on his fucking shoes. I'm like, yeah, he's got, they start, they start stomping on him again. You cocksucker. And you're like, oh my God, this poor guy. I get some money out of his pocket. So I'm reaching in his pocket to pay for the shoes, basically. You want to pay for my shoes? I'm, I'm like, well, I don't want to take his money. Let's get the goddamn money. Is Tony Plate's there? Tony Plate's a, he's an enforcer for the Gambinos, and he was a, he was also a friend of the family. So, you know, Thanksgiving come around, you got Tony Plate's there. Once in a while, these two would bump into each other. You know, Tony Plate, Dick Byron. And I'm still not understanding why what's going on why this guy's getting such a beating and uh anyway we clean up the blood and i go and i I sit next to my dad and i tell him 
what happened? I said, look, the dick's in the bathroom. He's, he's bad. He's like, look like he's going to die. To me, when you're like five, that looks like a murder scene. You know what I mean? Well, here's what happened. Here's what I found out later on. A few, was it weeks, a month prior, my dad and I had went to a house. Uh, he was looking at some, some paint work that needed to be done. The owner of the the owner of the house was Anthony Gadgie. Now he's the, he was a capo for the Gambinos. He was a powerful dude down here. I'm, I'm not down here. Where am I? I'm in New York, in Florida. Very powerful dude. So he's going to he's going to go out of town. He tells my dad, "I paint a few walls. We need an electrician. We need this. We need this. Take care of the, you know things. Just need to get done right because he's leaving." So I go with my dad. We look around. I need a little bit of paint. Not nothing big. Come to find out there was some electrical work. Now, Dick Byron was an electrical contractor. He needed lights changes, whatever the bullshit was. Well, he got in his fucking head that he was going to rob the house because Gadgy wasn't supposed to be there. He was supposed to go somewhere else or, you know, out of, with his wife. So he tells a bunch of scumbag thugs to, you know, go to the house, rob the house. Got pictures on the walls worth a million dollars. This guy's he's got a lot of money. Well, when they get there, Gadgie's there and his wife's there. Now these idiots don't know who Gadgie is. They have no clue. Well, they go throw him a beating. Now you throw him a, a, a mob bo a capo a beating in his own house <laughs> with in front of his wife, right? So they get away. They you know they get away and uh, the word gets on the street. My dad gets called in, and they're like, hey, question him. Thinking maybe he had something to do. And they're like, what the fuck? What the fuck? I got, you know. I'm like, okay, we know it wasn't you. Now, Dick had a gambling problem, and he had already owed 50000 He owed 50000 to the same family. It was the Gambinos that he, that he uh, went to the house. So they're thinking it's him. Well, the word on the street comes out back that it was Dick, that he hired a bunch of bums to rob the house. So now they're going to get this, they're going to get this motherfucker. Dick being a electrical contractor and broke always needing some money. He gets a call from an anonymous person and they tell him, uh, we got a, we're coming, we're coming in the town. We've got a big contract for you. Blah, blah, blah. Meet us at XYZ hotel down in Miami. So now Dick, Comes into the, the bar. He's happy as a pig and shit. So he's got this contract, and uh, he goes to this bar, this this hotel. And when he opens the door, at Tony Plate, same guy that threw him the beating. Tony Plate, Anthony Gaggi, Roy DeMeo are waiting for him. You imagine the look on your face when. So. They uh, they shot him. They started to cut him up. They were, you know, they were going to dismember him. They were in the middle of chopping him up, put him in a suitcase. And then, uh, I don't know, the, either the maid or the contractors, they were, they were working on the hotel. I think it was the contractors. They heard him in the hallway, so they stopped. They left the body there. And that was it. He, uh, he got, uh, they were going to chop him up and, and get rid of him. So they left the body in the shower. But a few days later, I, I was coming home from school. And I, he I heard my mom in the in the bedroom cry, her crying. She had her door slightly open. So I'm coming home and I hear crying, blah, 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 and I'm you know nosy motherfucker me. I'm like listening. Doors cracked, and she goes, "I can't believe what they they tried to cut his head off." And I'm like, well, "Who the fuck is this?" And then she goes, "Poor Dick." And then I started thinking, "Wait a minute, Dick." Then the beating in the bathroom. And my dad tells me. It's not what you think it is. And I was like, oh, Jesus. So that was my, that was my first, first lesson. Then I started to kind of understand, wait a minute, something's different here. And I had a, a couple things that uh, happened in school. I was, what grade was I? First or second grade? I was young and... I was usually pretty quiet, right? I hated school. You like school? Nah. Couldn't I fucking hate you, though. I couldn't. 
I was shit at school. Can't stand school. Uh, I was it. always told to sit outside and getting suspended. I fucking hated it. I wasn't good at it and I always felt embarrassed. Yeah. Because I, they would ask me questions and I would go red. I thought fucking slags. Same thing. I didn't, I couldn't, I, I can't. My problem is I hear shit and then after about, unless I'm really interested right, in martial arts, you can teach me martial arts. I pick it up like this. School, I have to be super, like, if, if it's either, if it's, if we're talking about snakes, for example. I used to love snakes when I was a kid. But I could, I could learn in a minute. I start talking about history or math, and then I just start, it's like, you ever watch Charlie Brown? Mm -hmm. And you had the teacher in the background, wah, wah, wah. I don't hear it. I just, I could read a book. I could literally read a book, read the whole page, and not know what the fuck it says. I could read. But it just doesn't go there because I'm thinking about 15 other things at the same time. My brain's like, -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga. so school wasn't definitely for me. So I, there was an incident we had, or I had, I was in school and this black kid. Now, racism back then, you know, how old are you? 40. I'm 40, I'm 52. So racism back then was, it, it was there. You know, it was always dropping the N-word e easily. And, and cracker this and cracker that, it, it, it is what it is. And I get shoved to the ground, kid trips me, and all my shit falls on the floor and I, I, there's a pencil, right? And I, I think one of the chapters of the book, I wanna st stick a pencil in your fucking eye, right? So, I think about it, nothing, you know, what am I going to do? He's a big dude. He's a big kid. My dad comes and uh, picks me up from school. And I tell him what happens. And in the middle of me telling him what happened, when I said this black, I mean, I didn't have to finish the sentence. He was driving down the street. He goes, what's wrong? What happened? I goes, well, this black kid did this. He does a U-turn right over the median. And he goes, which one? I said, he's, he's over by the uh, basketball courts. He'll be over there. So we pull up to the basketball courts and I said, that one right there. So he goes, all right, we're going to wait here. And he waits and he waits and he waits and he waits, and waits for hours and waits to see who picks him up. So he gets in the van, he gets in his van. It was like, I think it was a blue van. I get up behind him and he goes, grab a piece of paper. So he tells me, license plate number, write this down. So I don't know what's going on really. So I write it down, give it to him. A couple of days later, we're at one of the bars. It might've been Tiffany's over in, in, in Hollywood Circle. Anyway, some guys come in, Steve Maruka, and another guy, uh, in Coast, a guy that worked for the Coast Guard, Coast Guard John, we used to call him. And my dad's talking to him and hands him this license plate or the number, and says, oh, we need to know what, what this is. Make a long story short, we finds out where he lives. So uh, I go to my dad's house for like a week later, and uh, we're supposed to go, I'm supposed to go to school on Monday. So Monday comes around, Monday morning, he doesn't wake me up. I'm like, because now you're not going to school today. We've got some things to do. I'll tell your mother, whatever. So right around 3 o'clock, 2.30, 3 o'clock, we head over to my over to my school. He's got my dad in another car. All right, my dad drives a black Lincoln. We're waiting outside the school for this kid to show up to at the at the basketball. It's the same thing. Gets in, da da da. Gets in the car. Then then we start following him to the to his house. So I'm still not a hundred percent sure what's really about ready to go down. So we follow him all the way to his house, let them, you know, they're, they're back. They let them pull in. They've actually, they went to the grocery store first. They pull in, they unload the groceries and get in the house. Once they get in the house, then they get a little closer and we pull up. My dad and his buddies go up to the door, knock on the, do <laughs> knock on the door. And a nice black lady answers the phone and they said, uh, Miss so and so, we need, can we speak to your husband? And she's like, okay. And she she yells, I forgot the guy's name. I'll say James. James, uh, you got some visitors. And he's like, bitch. 
I don't want no motherfucking visitors. Shut the goddamn door. And he's like, James, you need to come out here. You need to come out here quickly. So you can hear the guy's really, really uh, just not a nice guy, right? So he finally comes, motherfucker, goddamn bitch, I told you, leave me alone, da 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 And he comes to the door, opens the door, and says, what the fuck do you, if that was it, that's all he had to say, what the, and bam, they went in, they started throwing this guy a beating. They beat him so bad, they had a, what those things called, the flapjack, or, you know those things the cops used to use, that had lead, with leather, you know, Anyway, they're beating him with this this thing and beating him and stomping the shit out of him. He's bleeding all over the place. Then the kid comes out, right? He's got he came out, comes out of the shower. He's got his towel on, about pisses his pants. And my dad goes, "You come here." He goes, "You tripped my son." Goes, yes, sir. He goes, "You see, see what we did to your father." He goes, yes, sir. He goes, touch my son again, see what happens. And they go back and forth, and the, the kid pisses his pants, literally pisses his pants. And I don't know if they said it there or when we left. Well, anyway, it ends up not being his dad. It's not his dad. We think, my dad thinks we're beating the shit out of his father. It's not his father. It is, huh? Well, it's his, it's, it's someone, like a boyfriend of the mother, right? <clears throat> so at the end, she goes, it's not his father. Well, we're outside, it's not his father. He goes, well, it's not his father, but you got the message. So as we're leaving, we're in the car and they're laughing. You motherfucker. And they're laughing. You beat the shit out of the wrong guy, right? You, you beat the wrong guy. Ah, fuck him. Don't worry about him. Then the lady comes out. Mr. Mr. Tony, Mr. Tony. And he turns around and he's like, oh, you know, does she have a gun? You don't know. She goes, Mr. Tony, listen, I prayed and I prayed to the Lord that something would happen. She goes, that's not his father, but you didn't get the wrong guy. That man beats me every day. And give him a big hug and a big kiss. And he goes, listen, my dad says, he's going to be out of work for at least a week. Gave her $1,000. Make sure he stays home. This is, and if anything happens, here's my number. You called me. She gave him a big kiss. Well, after she gave him the big kiss, then there was, uh, you know, you know, we won't say what, <laughs> but they start making fun of him. You know what I mean? But uh, then I knew, oh shit, we got something here. You know, that, you that's when I knew this something was different for sure because a bunch of Italian guys coming over, following, going to the house, beating the shit out of this guy, and I'm watching. And I'm like, oh, we can't be touched. How about you as a kid seeing that? Was it excitement, or were you scared, or do you start then feeling that you have power? I felt sorry for him at first, because you get a grown man. When you see a grown man, a big black dude, I'm talking a big man, he had cement, he was a cement worker, right? And he goes down, and then he starts crying. And they don't stop. They don't care, you know. You have a little mercy, right? They don't stop. They didn't stop back then. You know, I started feeling, I felt sorry for him. And, but well, I, I looked up at the mother, and I, I looked at her for a split second. The kid was shitting, but the mother was almost had a smile on her face. Just like that. A little, a little like, keep going, goddamn, keep going. And, you know, I, I can't say it, it, but afterwards, when I started thinking about it, then I, then I did think we're an, I'm un, untouchable, untouchable. And my dad told the dude, if something, if my kid falls down in school and scratches his knee, I'm, we're coming back here. So the next day, or a few days later, when I'm in school, and talking about fear and powerful i gave it a shot i said all right i want to see what i can do here <laughs> i gave it a shot this kid's sitting in the lunchroom with his other buddies i don't know if they're buddies but everybody's fucking scared of the guy and i walk up to him and i said you're in my seat and everyone looks at me like that you're fucking out of your mind i said get the fuck out of my chair he looks up 
And he puts his head down. He gets up and walks out. And that's it. That was when I knew. That incident shaped your life. That that right there was, I knew, okay, I got some backup here. Didn't know exactly how much, but enough to make this fucking kid, you know what I mean? I mean, that's big in, in elementary school. Do you start abusing your power, though? Where? Never. Do you feel as if you could start bullying? I never did. I never, I never, I was never a, I never took advantage or bullied people, innocent people. Never did that. Because you seem a cold character. You seem very cold, very straight. Mm -hmm. um, because I know some people are quite boisterous, they're quite out there. You seem very cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was never, uh, if if someone was like an innocent person, I was try to be respectful. They, sometimes innocent people get out of line and you put them right back in line. But if they're not, if they're in the game, if you're in the game, you're in the game. It's a whole nother ball game when you're in the game. You know, the, just like you said earlier, you know the rules. You know what you're getting into. There was things that I did as I as I got older. I never even, I won't even tell the story, but it was so horrific that I'm, but the guy knew. And I sat down with this guy and I said, listen, if anything ever goes south with you, you get arrested. This is on you. You don't, you don't, you keep, you fucking take the hit. Don't involve me. Don't mention my name and we'll be good. But if you try to bring me down, I'm, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you and anyone around you or anyone with you. Make that clear. And, you know, I did something that was pretty, pretty fucking horrible. But, and it wasn't to him because I couldn't find him. But, I mean, now when you think about it, you're like, but he knew the rules. What age did you start stealing drugs? 14? Yeah, so 14. And how's that? Because obviously in that life as well, I, mean, I used to think fucking drugs was was banned from the mafia. They were all fucking at it. Oh, they were listen, all at listen, it. The, the, ma <clears throat> the mafia is the biggest. They're so full of shit. Let me tell you what. They, they will, they'll rob a nun if they could, you know? They're in the church. They're everywhere. But yeah, you know, there's the rule, the golden rule. You wouldn't believe how many rules there were in the mob. There was no, no, no pornography. Okay, they didn't want anything to do with the government. No, no uh, counterfeit shit. No counterfeit money. Come on, they were doing everything because they don't want the, the government to get involved. Because there were certain rules that all right, don't do any fake fucking money. No, no prostituting people. I could understand that because that's someone's daughter. But they did it all. They did it all. The drugs. They were afraid of. I don't know. What were they afraid of the drugs? It's no different. The The feds are going to come after you. The feds are going to come after you. It's just another charge. But there was that standing rule, do not mess with the drugs. But then when they saw how much money was involved, you're talking billions of dollars. You know, they kind of did the, all right, uh, you know, the boss would say no drugs. And then you got the underboss, no drugs. And then you got the street bosses like the capos. And they're telling all their guys, no drugs. Wink. Make sure that I don't I want I don't want any drug money. So the word on the streets, no drug money with a wink. They're not to discuss it. Now there were capos that knew about it, of course. Were they still getting a percentage? They yeah. Uh, they just didn't say where it came from. Because if you're making all this money on drugs, and money's gotta get kicked up. You know. Uh, there was a few guys down in South Florida like Chile, Jerry Chile, that uh he didn't kick up shit. You know, there's stories that Jerry Chili got sent to South Florida. He got put on the shelf and this and that and the other. But Chili was a... Who's he? Jerry Chili was a capo for the Bonanno family. He was my my go-to guy. Jerry Chili was he, was... he was like the boss of Florida, you know. He had Traficantes up north, but Chili... Chili, you saw the movie uh, Donnie Brasco? Yeah, yeah, Okay, yeah. Donnie Brasco, in the book, in the book, I think in the back of the book, Chili was in that case. Jerry Chili, Steve Maruka. These two guys were in the case, but not in the movie. Don't know why. Then I don't think they ever got indicted for that, but Chili was the capo of the Bonanno family. He's the street boss. And a really good, good, good friend of mine, good friend of my dad's, my aunt. They had a they opened a bar together. So problem with Chili was he was like uh he was into everything. Everything. He didn't care. We you know how people say I don't give a fuck. Everybody says that. Chili was the only person I know that really didn't give a fuck. He really 
honestly did not give a fuck. Honestly, 100% did not give a fuck. He would do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and he didn't give a fuck. He'd go in front of the court. He goes, I don't care. I never talked. He spent, he must have spent 30 years in prison, on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. While he was in prison, he's already got 10 years. He's on the phone working a friend of mine, uh, Natty Passaro. Passaro's still on the street doing credit cards. You know, they, they had a great, great credit card fucking operation going back in the days. They would steal identities. They would, they would, print, they would print a card. They would put their own picture on it, and this, they would steal the code in the back. So this card is a, a duplicate. It's, it's gold. Well, Natty's on the street. Chili's in prison doing 10 years, and Chili's on the phone. Hey, what's going on? What's how much we got? Da, da, da. How much we got? I mean, and Natty's like, so be careful on the phone. I don't give a fuck. I'm, how much? What, 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 what do we do today? How much? We do? And he's going back and forth. And he's talking on the phone. He knows not to, but he don't give a fuck. He just don't care. Well, Natty gets indicted, along with a whole bunch of other people. And Chili gets indicted, too, while he's in jail. So now they had this thing where you got, you got Natty, Chili, and six or seven others are all indicted. And there was a, they, they charged them together. And the way they were going to do the deal was you all had to plea together. I think they call it a global plea. So you all plead guilty or you all go to trial, if I'm understanding it right. Anyway, but Chili turned around because Chili was only looking at two years. He turned around two years, fuck it. Everyone else was looking at a lot more time. And if they went to trial and lost, he was going to get fucked. So they asked Chili, look, we're, we're going to do this and we, you know, we're thinking of going to trial and da 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 if if they go to trial, Chili has to go to trial. And Chili could have pled to two years. So Chili goes, I can't tell you what to do. You want to go to trial? We'll go to trial. You know, the average guy would have said, take the fuck, you know, take the deal. I'll get two. You'll get seven. That was the average guy would have said, because he's taking us two years. Fuck you. He said, whatever you want to do. If we go to trial, we lose. Fuck it. He didn't, he didn't give a fuck. What was the first bit of gear you got at 14? What drugs did you buy? Cocaine. I didn't, it, you know what? I, we, I stumbled upon it. <laughs> Hope so. When I was about, I was 14, almost 15. My uncle used to smuggle. He was a speedboat guy, you know, in the race boats out of, out of North Miami Beach. So he's going back and forth to, from Bimini to Hallover. Bimini Hallover with tons of weed. His weed was the big thing back then, right? Cocaine was expensive. Kilo of coke, you're talking eighty thousand dollars back then, like one kilo. Eighty, that's a lot of money. I was getting them for twelve. So you're talking like late seventies, early eighties, a lot of money. So he'd go back and forth, back and forth. Then finally, he the cops were on to him, and he got pulled over with some bullshit like a gram or two, nothing big. And they actually just threw it out. They said, we don't, we're, we're going to get you. We're going to get you. We're not going to get you for this bullshit. They ended up getting it for something stupid. And he goes in to, before the judge. And on a first offense on something small, it was either jail or rehab. All right, fuck it. So he goes to rehab. He goes to rehab for 10, uh, a year. So a year, year in rehab. He's come out clean because he used to love his shit, boy. He could fucking snort. Me and him would have gone. <laughs> Man, I, I watched him. <clears throat> I watched him as a joke. Because mm -hmm. after I started selling, he goes, oh, let me get a little, 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 little. And I said, I'll give it to you if, if you snort a whole gram. I put a whole gram on the table. Now, this isn't whacked up. There's, this is like 98% pure flake. Proper. Whole gram, he goes... <clears throat> I'm like, holy shit, I've never seen anybody do that in my life. He was really angry afterwards, so he tried to throw a fucking a crystal something at me. It fucked him up, right? Pissed him off. Well, anyway, <clears throat> my uncle, when he gets out of when he gets out of uh rehab, he's got some money left over from before. He's a few million bucks, but he's spending. 
just like everybody, they spend and spend. And nothing's coming in. He didn't get back into the, the, the drug game. He loses everything. I mean, everything. How much? Millions. Spends it all, basically. Partying still? Did it get still? Was it still high yep. when he came out? So that and living like he was before. No, living like a king, like kingpin. He's in the he's on the penthouse. He's got the whole top floor of Turnberry Isles. This is down in North Miami Beach. He's got a car called Pantera. You ever hear of a Pantera car? Oh. It's it's a rare sports car. Pantera, Corvette, Mercedes, three speed boats. And little by little, he sells the car. There's fifty grand in his pocket. Then he sells the other car. All right. And so sooner or later he sells he's got nothing. He moves in with us. Right? So I'm like fifteen. 14, 15, he's sleeping, he's sleeping in the upstairs loft. And I'm like, oh man, and uh, didn't know exactly what the hell was going on with him. I wasn't, my mom never told me, I, I didn't know he sold drugs, I had no clue. Then as we're getting close, there's a guy down the street from where I live, I mean, 10 houses. He's young. He's about, when I was, he was 16. He was a little older than me, maybe a year and a half. And this kid's always driving a new, uh, brand new car. Expensive cars too, not like fucking Ford Expo. It, this shit was like Corvettes, Lamborghinis. And this is like, and there he goes, into a house that he bought, 16 years old. And my uncle says, you know that guy? I said, yeah, I know him. I know his sister well. He goes, ask him if you can get an ounce of Coke. I said, how do you know he sells Coke? And he goes, just ask him if you can get an ounce of Coke. So I said, all right, I'll ask. So I go down there and I'm, I go, hey, let me, you know, let me talk to you about something. And he goes, what's up? I go, this doesn't come from me. This comes from someone else because I'm, you know, I don't want to offend you. I don't know. So, but can I get an ounce of Coke? <laughs> yeah, he goes, ounce of Coke? He goes, who's it for? It's for my uncle. He goes, your uncle? Goes, yeah, my uncle. Yeah, he knew him. He saw him. He was fucking 10 houses away. He goes, all right, I'll get you an ounce of Coke, but I'm going to give it to you. I'm not giving it to your uncle. It's yours. You're responsible. Something happens, you're on the hook. And I said, all right, fuck it. I'm not worried about it at all. I had no idea what I was in for, right? I get this ounce. I bring it to my uncle. Look at this. He goes, wow, that's good. I go, okay. And he puts the thing on. Does it, right? So at this time, he doesn't even have a car. He's got no car. I got a little Toyota, whatever the fuck it was, Corolla or something. He goes, all right, take me to this house, this house. We had beepers. He goes, all right, we're going to go here. And he starts calling people. Da, 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 da. And then on a Friday night comes, the, the beeper starts going, beep, 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 beep. I got everything bagged up into grams. And boom, there goes the, there goes the ounce. Well, not all of it, about half of it. I got about 14 grams of it. So we've got... A little bit left over, and then we sell a little more. But at the end of the day, the ounce is sold, and there's not enough money. I'm like, wait a minute. We should have had, when you do the math, it should have been $1,400, right? 50 bucks a gram, 28 grams is $1,400. We got like 500 bucks. I'm like, this motherfucker, he snorted it all. <laughs> he snorted most of it. <laughs> so now... I'm on the hook, but I know everybody now because I drove, I drove him everywhere. So I went, I went to the, I went back to the dude. We call him fat man. I said, listen, I don't have your money. <laughs> I said, but I got 500. He goes, what the fuck happened? I go, this fucking guy, my uncle snorted it all. He goes, this son of I said, listen, but I know every single person he sold it to. I got the beeper. I got his beeper. They all know me. So when that thing goes off, I'll sell it. He goes, here's another ounce. And from there, boom, that was it. It went ounce, 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 half a key, quarter key. And 
that was my, you know, it started, took, it took two or three weeks. And it went from grams to quarter ounces, ounces. Then I was selling ounces and I was like, hmm. It started getting a little scary there. Why? Because there was a lot of people calling. A lot of people calling. And then I got set up. I got set up by, and I did my research. You know, when you do crime, do your fucking research. Look at how much time you're going to get if you get caught, right? So research said if you get caught with an ounce, <clears throat> 28 grams or more is a three-year minimum mandatory. That means what an ounce? An ounce. Three-year minimum. And the judge has no control. That minimum mandatory, judge's hands tied, can't do anything about it. Even um, even first offense? First offense. Can't do shit. That's this is the scary thing. First offense. So three year minimum mandatory, first offense, and the way the law is written says a substance containing cocaine. Could be ninety nine percent sugar with two grams two percent cocaine, you get in charge with the whole thing. So it doesn't matter how much impurities or a cut you put in it they don't care the only thing they do take out is the water because it gets wet from humidity so i'm giving everyone 27 27 and a half grams i'm never giving them a full ounce because i know right underneath that 28 grams 20 27.9 you're in possession with intent to distribute different charge first offense probation mm. okay so let's keep it at probation. I'll take strike one all day long, you know? Then this guy that was a friend of a friend that I've seen her, I've seen her around, wants an ounce, two ounces actually, wants two ounces. I'm like, no, no, don't want to do it, don't want to do it, don't want to do it. Then we go back and forth, back and forth. And I speak to the kid down the street and he goes, you know him? I go, it's this guy, Tony Lopez. He goes, I know, he knew Tony Lopez. Because they had house parties over at, at his house. You know, the, the the big, he goes, yeah, I know Tony Lopez. He seems okay. He goes, uh, they've been asking me for ounces and ounces. I said, he goes, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. He goes, he didn't ask me. Yeah, I know he ain't asking you, he's asking me. You're the big wig, he's asking me. So after weeks go by and I, you know, I tell him no, 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 no. And finally, <clears throat> I forgot why I said yes. But anyway, I ended up saying yes to an ounce. But they were, they were insistent on two ounces. And I, I didn't want to do two ounces. Didn't want to do it. Because I knew fucking two ounces is trouble. Three years. Uh, yeah. Three years at least. So I ended up meeting this guy at, uh, out in a parking lot somewhere it was uh, for 441 and in Hollywood outside of a Kmart show it was Kmart's like a bullshit store it's not around anymore and I was with my girlfriend and my girlfriend was 18 okay she's an adult I'm 16 now at the time I'm 16 so he gets in the car he gets in the back seat she's in the front seat she just wanted to go because we were going out to dinner and I was like, let me just go do this. I'll come right back. She goes, let me just, let me ride with you. I'm like, okay. I pull the fucking bag out of my pants. I give it to him. And he's looking at it in the back seat. And he says, oh, this is beautiful shit. And he said it really loud, too. You know what I mean? I'm like, that was a fucking, but when he said that, here I am. I'm in the car, right? I'm in the parking lot but I'm towards the end of the parking lot where no one's parked. Everyone else is parked near the fucking store. When he said that, this fucking black van came right in front. Urgh! Slide, they slide the fucking door open. They all got masks on like fucking ninjas, okay? I thought I was dead. They come, pull me out of the car, gun to the head, girlfriend, gun to the head on the ground. Because there was a lot of people getting killed back then for bullshit, just robberies, just stupid shit. And I got my gun, gun, I'm on the ground, I'm under the car, and I'm looking, and I'm looking at my girlfriend, she's under the car, on the other side, right? Gun to the head. And this motherfucker's, they take him away. 
So the cops are da 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 da. They get my driver's license and they go, he's only 16. And they're yelling, the cops are yelling back and forth. He's only fucking 16 years old. What are we doing? What are we doing? He's going to be home tomorrow. And here I am thinking, mother, fuck yeah, I'm going home tomorrow. Because you're a juvenile, right? Nothing. You don't charge with You're not an adult. Dude. You're fucking 18. So I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going home tomorrow. So <clears throat> they get they get my ID. They say, <clears throat> he's only 16 years old. He's going home tomorrow. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going home tomorrow. I'm like, now I'm cocky. Because I'm thinking, you fucking assholes, right? I'm cocky. But they go, oh, but she's 18. She's going to prison. She's oh, going to jail. Put the blame on So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, wait a minute. She had nothing to do with that. So she had nothing to do with it. She was sitting in the passenger seat. She didn't know what was going on. She had nothing to do with this. She didn't even know I had it on me. I said, well, we'll let the court decide that. Take her down, fucking book her. The bail's fifty thousand dollars for an ounce. Fifty fucking thousand dollars to get out. Me, <clears throat> I think I'll be home in twenty four hours. So I go to the. Oh, this is a great story. I go to the Hollywood police station, and I forgot I had between my legs. I had another ounce, all bagged up, right. For, you know, Graham here, Graham here. So well, I'm in the holding cell. And the first, first I get, I get questioned, blah, 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 blah. And with all the adrenaline, I completely forgot that I, I have this bag of Coke. So I'm thinking, all right, they got me for an ounce, 27 grams. Worst case scenario, worst case scenario, probation. Add that to this and tell the, tell the judge, oh, I'm not a drug dealer. Oh, really? You got everything all bagged up. So I got this bag under between my legs. I'm thinking, oh, fuck. So they're taking pictures, doing this uh, fingerprint and all this shit. And I finally go, oh, man, I got to go to the bathroom. I got to go really bad. I got to go really bad. And they go, hold it. I said, this, I can't hold it. I got to take shit, man. I got I to gotta go. And he goes, not so fast. And I'm like, oh, shit. So he goes, put your hands, you know, hands up. He starts patting me down. He puts his hands in my pants and he just puts his thumbs around my waistband and goes like this all the way around like this and says, okay, go in. It was, it was a Jesus moment. I don't know if Jesus would save you from that, but it was a Jesus, <laughs> it was a Jesus moment for me. <clears throat> so now I'm in the, I'm in the, uh, I'm in the, the holding cell. And there's a kid in there. He's about nine years old. Ten. Frankie or something. So what the fuck did you do? Yeah, I got caught stealing a soda out of a soda machine. And now you reach underneath. He kid, yeah, he did something. So I said, are you kidding me? Said, yes, I watched the door. I said, if the cops come, let me know. So I'm over here. There's a, you're sitting on a toilet like this. And there's just a little petition, a little wall. So I could see him. And he can see out the window. So I got all these bags and I'm thinking in my head, wait a minute, how many people have been in this holding cell flushing shit down the toilet? They've got to have something down there that they're catching stuff, you know? I'm thinking, I'm like, yeah, I'm paranoid. You know, I'm, I'm being super cautious. So I'm taking <clears throat> each bag and I'm opening it and I'm rinsing it out in the toilet bowl, right? So it's one, two, and I've got fucking 20, 20 to go or something like that. And he goes, they're coming, they're coming. I said, do something, do something, stop, do something. This fucking kid, when they start coming, he lays on the floor like he's having a heart attack. He's down there going like this. I thought the kid was dying, right? He's and they're, they're working on him, they're working on him, and they're calling rescue. And they're like, oh fuck, call nine, call rescue, call this. And he's and I'm I'm over here emptying every fucking bag. This fucking kid faked the heart attack. What the fuck <laughs> he fucking faked? The best actor in the world. Well, I ended up saving his ass when we went to when we went to uh, juvenile. Ended up going to juvenile, and they were beating the shit out of this poor kid. He was young. So what did you get? Well, here you won't believe what happened to me, man. I go to juvenile. <clears throat> you can't make this shit up. It's impossible. I go to juvie. I'm sitting there. 
and you, you, I'm going to see the judge within 21 days. All right, within 21 days, I got to see a judge. I'm talking to all the black kids that are in there. And they, What'd you do, cracker? I said, I got to call with an ounce of powder. Oh, shit, you'll be out of here in two days. Everyone said the same thing. Every black kid said the same, man, you don't sweat it. You're out of here in a few days. I go, what'd you get caught with? He goes, man, I stole a car with two kilos and a gun. I, I'm, I, you know, this is my third time. I'm going, yeah, I'm like, damn. Life? No, juvies. They're all juvenile. They'll be out in 21 days. Because they're not 18? They're not 18. Not 18. Just regular old. After they do it three or four times, then maybe they go to, they get sentenced. You can get a year as a juvenile defender. But these guys were doing some crazy shit. So they go, don't, don't sweat it. You'll be out. My dad comes in. Did he visit? I think he came to visit or it was on a phone call. Might have been a visitation. I think it was a visitation. What's he said? Well. Did he they, know you were active back then? Did he know you were selling gear? Uh, he heard something, but I denied it. Actually, one of my neighbors told on me. Like a neighbor that was like a father figure neighbor, but kind of, you know, he didn't have any kids, but he went down and told on me. He went to a bar and he goes, you know, your son's selling fucking dope. And my dad said something to me and I was like, no, not me. I just hang out with the kid down the street sometimes. So actually when I did get arrested, that's a funny story. They called my dad and they said, we got your son down here in Hollywood police station. And he's going to, you know, we're going to get him to, we, we want to talk to him. This is what they said. We want to talk to him. And you can't talk to me without my parent. I'm at 16, you have to have your dad there. So it was Dave Green, the son of a bitch. Dave Green was a, it was a sheriff, but he was in charge of the organized crime task force. You have the FBI, which is federal, like going after the mob. And you also have the, like the, the local police. They also have organized crime task force. These are like the wannabe FBI's, right? But they can still nail you. They can still nail you good. So Dave Green, this son of a gun, was really after my dad. And he was on the list with everyone else. So when I got arrested and down sent to Hollywood Police Station, they got they got Anthony Cayucci. Well, it goes in the system. They tell Dave Green they got Anthony Cayucci. He goes, Woo, no, well, we got the young one. We don't got the the one you're looking for. We got the young one. So they tell Green, Green calls my dad and says, oh, we got you. We got you, kid. And boys, we're going to make him squeal. He goes, okay, I'll be down there. Give me about five or ten minutes. I'll be down there and we can talk to him. You can talk to him, but got to wait for me. My dad goes back to sleep. So Dave calls him back and says, what were you doing? Kai, you know, we're over here waiting. He goes, who's this? Who's this? He goes, this is Detective Green. We have your son in custody. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. I was just dreaming about your wife. You fucked my dream up. He goes, you cocksucker. He goes, I'm not coming down there. So they never did have a, a conversation. <laughs> they never did have a conversation. They told, when I was in the holding, they go, oh, your dad's coming. Your dad's coming. I said, coming where? Oh, he's coming here so we can talk to you. I said, who said that? I said, your dad said that. And I said, he told you? And I'm sitting there laughing inside going, you dumb fuckers. You really think he's showing up? You really think he's going to come? So in the meantime, they ended up sending me down to the, the juvie. When I get there, like I said, they tell me I'm going to go home. My dad comes to visit and he goes, no, this was one in 10 million chance that this could happen. My dad says, just trying to make me feel good, right? He tells me. He goes, you know Tom Lynch? I go, yeah, I know Tom Lynch. He was a business partner of my dad. He goes, his son's a judge, and we got him. I go, what do you mean we got him? He goes, we got him. Don't worry, you're good to go. See, my dad's thinking the same thing everyone else is thinking. He, I'll be out in a week. It's the first offense. Never been arrested. Under an ounce, okay? Be out in a week. 21 days goes by. I'm going to see the judge. I'm handcuffed to all the other black kids. We're sitting in the, in the courtroom. We actually sit in the jury booth because there's no one there. 
And the judge comes in and he sits down. And I look at the nameplate. Thomas Lynch Jr. the third. And I'm thinking to myself, you have to be fucking kidding me. How in the world did the mafia organize me to get in front of this judge? I'm walking out of here. This is the same judge my dad told me. We got the judge. So inside I'm doing, I'm like, I can't believe I'm going home, man. This is, this is a hell of a story. And the judge goes, I have to bring it to the court's attention that I know the defendant's father, Anthony Cayucci, and I have to recuse myself from this case. And I was like, what the fuck did he, what did that, what does that even mean, recuse? I'd never heard the word before. And the black kid next to me goes, damn, man, your daddy knows the judge. He didn't let you go. That's fucked up, man. What kind of I was like, you got to be kidding me. This whole thing was a, it was a coincidence. We didn't have the fucking judge. We just so happened to get the judge accidentally. That day, I ended up in front of the same judge that my dad said, oh, we got him. No, it was an accident that he was substituting for the, the real judge. So they send me back to uh, the detention center. Then I get another visit from a black lady. And she goes, Mr. Coyote, I've got good news and I got bad news. I said, well, well which one do you want to hear? Because the sound of bad news is not good news. I'll tell you that. Not in this situation. She goes, the bad news is they're charging you as an adult. I said, what? What do you mean they're charging me as an adult? I'm 16 years old. She goes, yeah, but you were caught with an ounce of cocaine, actually. She goes, no, actually, 34 grams. I said, oh, no, 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 34 grams. 27 and a half, to be exact. And she's flipping through the thing. She goes, no, 34 grams. The cops added a little extra, whatever they wanted to, to make sure it was way above the, you know, the minimum, the minimum, right? She goes, but the good news is they're going to send you down to the county and you'll get a bail and you'll be out. You bail, you bail, you know, you ban, you bond out $50,000 just like the girlfriend did. All right. Is she out by that? She day? got out. She got out. My dad got her out. <clears throat> so I get charged in the, as an adult. So when we go down to the, I got to go to this before they can technically charge as an adult. There has to be some sort of small proceeding. So we're in the we're in the courthouse and we go in front of the, the the juvenile judge, the real juvenile judge, and we're in his chambers type of thing. And he goes, "What's going on here?" I go, oh, "We're charging Anthony Cayucci with direct file uh, as an adult." He goes, "What? Was there a gun? No gun." Anybody get hurt, injured? No, no one's got injured. How many what, How many times has he been arrested? Never. He sits back in his chair and he goes, what the hell's going on here? We got a kid with a clean, clean record. No one's been hurt. There's no violence. There's no gun, no weapon. What, what are we doing? You know, why are you doing this? I said, well, his mentality is not of the average 16 year old and he has many, many connections in the drug trade and other, other shit. He goes, I don't wanna hear all these technicalities. I wanna know why are we charging him? Right now we have one ounce of cocaine, first offense, juvenile, 16 years old. He goes, well, it's a, it, exactly what he said. It's in the state's discretion. The state, the state of Florida has the right to do basically whatever they want. And the judge, he goes, all right, you got 20 minutes because they didn't fill out the paperwork right. He goes, if this shit ain't back at my office in 20 minutes, I'm, let, I'm, I'm dismissing the case. Well, they had it back in 10 minutes, right? <clears throat> so the judge was not happy. So I get sent over to the adult court. Now when I go to the adult court, I'm with my attorney, and it's supposed to be a lottery system. You don't, you know, they don't give certain people certain judges. They can't say, okay, well, all organized crime is going to go to this judge. No. It's like they throw it in a bag and who, whatever judge gets it, whatever judge gets it. <clears throat> but something didn't seem right because I was, all my luck was not right. You know, even, even the black lady that, that told me you're being charged as an adult. She's like, let me flip through your, 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 your fucking file here. 
and she's flipping and she goes, I don't see anything. She goes, you're an, you got an, you're an Indian, Indian Kahuchi. What kind of name is Kahuchi? She goes, you're in, I go, I'm not Indian. I'm Italian. She goes, boom, that's it. You're Italian. They got you. <laughs> they go, they don't ever get Italians. You're like, you know, the regular white boy. Fine. But they don't get Italians. You don't get a lot of Italians. 16 selling shit. They think they got somebody, right? So that was their excuse. So then I get in front of this judge, Coker. Judge Thomas Coker. Now, now Coker was a death sentence judge. Here I am with an ounce of cocaine going in front of someone who does mostly murder cases. Judge Coker, if you, if you Google him, he killed more people sent more people to the electric chair in an 18-month sentence than any judge in U.S. history. He likes killing people, right? So my, my attorney tells me, you got Judge Coger. He's a, they call him the executioner. So I'm fucking... <laughs> are you shutting yourself? I'm fucking executioner. <clears throat> I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? How, what, what, you, what the fuck is going on? <clears throat> So the very first day we go to court and the judge goes, what is this case doing on my docket? One ounce, one ounce of cocaine. He's saying, he asked the same thing. Who died? Who'd he kill? Any weapons? What is going on? Because I got a full docket of killers, murderers, and rapists. And I've got a one ounce of cocaine of a 16 year old. Are you, what is this? So he, he was saying that? He, was, he, he was saying this. He's a judge that sees murder cases, mm -hmm. violent rapes. And here he is with a 16 year old first offense the state could say whatever they want about my mentality and my connections they don't judges don't care about that shit they want to know the facts the facts is he's 16 one ounce of cocaine no priors that's that's the facts you could say what you want about his connections it's bullshit to them so he goes calls the attorney and the prosecutor goes up to the up to the thing it was listen make this go away today hey, let's cut a deal i don't want to see this i don't want to take this to trial so the judge and the attorney, they come, they go, listen, they want to, they, they'll, they'll, they'll plead you down. You plead guilty to possession with intent to, to distribute. That's that one underneath that 28, you know, that first charge. That's where I kept that 27 grams. That's what I should have been at yeah. the whole time. Intent to supply. In, intent to supply, right. Not intent to sell. But um, they go, Let's, I'll take the deal. Fuck it. They go, but you need to cooperate. Anything. Just put a phone number on a piece of paper of someone. You don't even have to set anyone up. You don't have to talk. You just, a name and a phone number and we'll call that cooperation. Said, so can't do it. Can't do it. So went back to the judge and says, they're asking him to cooperate and he, he says, he can't do it. Judge says, oh, sorry to hear that. And boom, okay. Court is set for, you know, next month. And they do that and they do that next month, next month. And this goes on for two years of postponements. They just keep postponing because they're trying to, you know, they're trying to do a motion to dismiss. They're trying to find out who the informant is. We're trying to find out this. We're, we're trying to find out everything we can. Anyway, we find out the informant was 21 years old. The judge didn't like that. You have an adult setting up a juvenile. Guy's 21, kid's 16. He gets caught with like a half a, half a key. He's setting him up for an ounce. Usually you're supposed to, if you get caught with a half yeah, a key, they go, bits. They go at least the same or a little more, get yeah. some for a key. And the whole thing, and this fucking guy gets probation and I'm locked up, right? So they go back and forth with this and it comes down to trial, day of the trial, trial date. Judge says the same thing. Can we make this go away? There's something we can do. Can we plead this down? I don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna take this to trial. He really didn't want to. And the state said the same thing. He's got to cooperate. He's got to do something. I said, listen, two years have gone by. I haven't done anything. I don't know anybody. I'm not cooperating. It is what it is. So why don't we just, I'll plead guilty to under 27. And the judge even said in one of the arguments, because you're charging him with an ounce of cocaine. He goes, it's 34 grams. Because I've never in my history seen a drug dealer give more than what was asked for. He goes, it's always less. They always take something for them. This is the judge talking, you know? He goes, he's, he's given you know, six grams extra, seven, you know, extra, something doesn't add up. 
So we go to trial. And uh, my judge, my attorney says, we just need one mother on that, on that uh, jury that's going to say, you know, not guilty. We just need one person so we don't get a, a guilty. You just need one to hold back. Well, here's the messed up part. The jury does not know how much time you're going to get if you're found guilty. They don't know. In their mind, he's 16, first offense, if we find him guilty, what are they going to do? What would your thoughts be? You would, be, you would think 16, first offense, ounce of cocaine, what are they going to do? Probation, a year maybe? That, that's the average person's thought that on a first offense with no violence, okay? And my attorney says, well, the, they don't know what's going to happen to you. I said, wait a minute. You're telling me that the ju judge, the jury has no clue what's going to happen to me? I said, what about trial by judge? Because I could take it to, to the judge. Because the judge seemed like he was, he was siding for me a little bit. You know, he was the judge. He's going to go right down the law, whatever the law is. Unless there's some, unless they did something wrong, entrapment or something to that effect. He goes, you know, we're better off with the 12, 12 people jury. So I had a plan. I says, well, they might not tell the jury how much time I'm looking at, but that doesn't stop me from telling them, okay? So it's my time to take the stand, right? So I've got this fucking plan in my head. And I'm waiting for the right time. And I have to say, I was quite, I was quite brilliant at, at trial, but it didn't work. <laughs> but it was great. You know, when you watch these TV shows, in the in the uh, the prosecutor, they start rattling off these questions one at a time. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? And they, about that, and you're like, blah, 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 right? But did you know that between each question, you're allowed to call your attorney up? Every question. He goes, were you here on this day? I, said, I like to consult counsel. The attorney has to get up, come over here. And you can sit over here and talk to him for five fucking minutes before you answer that question. So why does no to do that then? Huh? Why does no one do it that fucking, then? I don't know. But I, I did it to stop the, to stop the, the momentum and to give myself time to think because I knew I was going to lie. But they catch you when you're going, you know, that fast, that fast. And I said, no, no, no. So even if I knew the answer, I brought him over and I, I just tell him, I'm just killing some time here. He's like, okay, all right. All right. And then he's got uh, Mr. Coyote's clearly trying to uh, disrupt the, the court proceedings or whatever. I said, Your Honor, my life here. Oh, I did something like this. I said, Your Honor, I'm looking at a maximum of 30 <laughs> years in prison. And when I said that, he fucking, the prosecutor freaked out because now the jury knows I'm looking at a maximum of 30 years in prison because the judge told me something. I said, your honor, I'm looking at 30 years in prison here. And you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to discuss how much time you're looking at because now the jury's going, this poor kid's going to get 30 years in prison. Not guilty. We don't want to hear anymore. Right? So the, the fucking prosecutor jumps ah, he's screaming like he's having a fucking like he's tampons are getting shoved up his ass he's having a hissy fit he comes up no your honor da, 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 da. okay boom 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 he tells the jury to go to the back room and i'm like what happened here so my attorney and the prosecutor they're up there talking and they're asking i hear a mistrial mistrial means start over basically new jury new jury knew everything they're tainted and uh, the prosecutor goes, no, 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 we'll continue. And the judge goes, you're, you're not allowed to mention. And I was like, what do you mean, Your Honor? That I can't, the jury's not allowed to say, the jury's not allowed to know how much time I'm looking at. I'm playing dumb because I already knew this. He goes, no, you can't tell them. You can't say anything about how much time you're looking at. Okay. So I, I was able to throw another one in. We're asking me questions, da, da, da. and I said, Lawson, you guys are trying to send me to prison for almost the rest of my life. And they objected, right? Another one, send the jury back. And I go, your honor, 
I didn't say how much time. I said almost the rest of my life. That's not a definitive amount of time. That's, you know, they just don't be wise at you. They say, <laughs> Try don't, play be games. A, don't, <laughs> don't play games in my court, young man. I'm like, okay. All right, that was the last one I, I played. And uh, I just played the, you know, the innocent, tried to play the innocent fucking kid. Anyway, they tried to get him on. And the, their, the defense was, is an adult, he comes after a kid. This could happen to anyone. Adult persuaded this kid. And their defense was, listen to this fucking kids. Listen to, listen to this, the way he talks on these recordings. This is no average 16 year old we got here. So they came back with, they came back with guilty. They came back with guilty. So now sentencing comes. Right, sentencing is like six weeks later. They got to do a pre-sentence investigation and see all your criminal background. Might have none. They're looking at your father's background also, or just yours? No, they're just looking at mine. They're just looking at mine for the judge. But it doesn't mean they haven't taken in consideration everything they already know that they can't tell the judge. Yeah. Right. So the original plea deal was if I pled guilty and did not go to trial, I didn't go to trial, right? They would give me the minimum three years, all right? Three-year minimum mandatory, that's the minimum. I don't cooperate, three years, and you go away. So I talked to the attorney. He goes, eh. I go, what's our chances of winning? He goes, I think we got a good chance. I go, 50-50, 60-40, what is it? Eh, he's six, a little more than 60%. I'm like, all right, 60%, three years. Three years a long fucking time when you're fucking now I'm 18, I'm 18, I'm 21. I'm like, right, I'll go to trial. So so the original deal was it been three years. So now it's sentencing day, and my pre-sentence investigation comes back clean. They the prosecutor tells my attorney, whispers in his ear. The arresting officers are coming to testify and they're going to crucify him. As I said, they're going to crucify him. So my attorney in his infinite fucking wisdom has to tell me this. He didn't have to tell me that. They, they're going to crucify you. So here I am. Like, I just, I went, I lost all my blood. That's like, <laughs> they're going to fucking crucify me, right? I'm like, why would you even tell me that? Just keep that to yourself, man. All right? So there was a big accident on the way to the courthouse where the car, all the cars got stopped and no one could make it through. So the, they're waiting for the police officers to show up to testify before sentencing. It's not really testifying. It's, all right, we think he should get this much time because here's what our investigation showed and he should be blah, blah, blah. So they want to come and try to hit me with like 10 years on my first offense, okay? But they don't show up. So the prosecutor's like, hey, um, the police officers are running a little behind. We need to wait another 10 minutes. The judge says, no, we're starting right now. I don't care. Basically, I don't care. So the state says, uh, blah, blah, blah. We're asking for the minimum of 10 years, the maximum of 30. I'm thinking, a minimum of 10 fucking years. Jesus Christ. And my attorney gets up there and argues the same thing he's done before. He said, listen, he's a kid. He's 16 years old. 16 years old, first offense. You know, he, he, he never hurt anybody physically. He's not violent. And this, this, and this. And the judge, he, judge starts to read out the sentence. Okay, I, however they read it, and he goes, the, the charge is trafficking cocaine. It carries a minimum of three years with a maximum of 30 years and i'm listening to this and your heart is like what the what is he gonna happen when you hear that maximum of 30 years and i got the death penalty judge that likes to hang people you know you think you're dead he goes i sentence you to four and a half years as a youthful offender with a recommendation of boot camp right and he bang he clanks the fucking thing so i'm thinking fuck four and a half years and then it, my, the fucking little weasel prosecutor jumps up and objects. He's freaking out. 
Your Honor, no, no, you did not. We, we offered this before. He rejected it, and he's fucking slamming the mallet. Sit down, sit down. My decision's final. One more time, and you're in contempt of court. And my judge, uh, my attorney comes up to me, because you fucking nailed it. I go, what do you mean? He goes, they recommended boot camp. I said, what the fuck is boot camp? He goes, it's 90 days, 90 days, and you're out. He goes, you just got to make the boot camp. You have to complete the boot camp. I said, fuck, I can run through hell for 90 days. Are you kidding me? He goes, once you get to boot camp, 90 days, you're home. So you got to get the boot camp first. So they recommended it. I go to jail. I go to prison. Then they have to actually put you in the boot camp. And that's like a 90% of the time if the recommendation goes through. The recommendation went through after about, I did about a year and a half, approximately. It seems a bit extreme, though, for an ounce of gear. But is that because of the family background? Or that's the was little, it just pure bad luck? That, the, the ounce of gear is the law. The law, the three, that, that 28 grams is for anyone who's found guilty. Anyone. doesn't matter. The problem was where they got me was charging me as the adult. That was the family background. They should have never charged me as an adult. If you read the law now, it says it's in the, up to the discretion of the court can charge you as an adult, but the crimes have to be either one, multiple drug charges, multiple violence, rape, murder, kidnapping, something like that. It's instant. You can be 14 years old and they charge you as an adult in Florida. You kill someone like intentionally, you get charged as an adult. You won't get the electric chair, but they will charge you and don't give you life, life, life and life prison. So what happens when you came out then? Was it straight back to business? No, it wasn't straight back to business. There was a big party for me. I was on probation for a while. Were uh, you still with the same ghetto? Did she fuck off? No. Yeah, we, we had to, it, it, even before the trial, uh, there were, because we were considered co-defendants, my dad was like, stay away from her. And I didn't want to stay away from her, stay away from her. Just, you, I'm telling you, you got nothing to do with her. She's going to flip. You want nothing to do with her. And I was like, oh man. And this girl, she had balls like you've never seen. And for no reason. She was, she was charged with trafficking cocaine, cocaine, 18 years old. There was no getting out of it for her. Right. All we could say was. And they didn't even want me. See, here was, here's what they tried to pin me. Just say, it was, you know, if you say she had nothing to do with it, it was all me. Okay, well, explain to us it was all me. You're just making yourself guilty, right? You're, you're saying you're guilty by explaining how she had nothing to do with it. Prove it. Tell us what you did. That, and not, not, now I'm hammered. I got no court case, right? So they, they said, you got to keep your mouth quiet. I got to stay quiet. And she's got to con just say she had nothing to do with it. So we talked a few times. <clears throat> we never fought. I mean, we weren't really good, you know, but we ended up breaking up. And she never said a word and refused to take the stand. Refused. Fucking refused. They were, said, listen, we're charging you or you take the stand. You take the stand. We'll let you go. She goes, I will not take the stand. Oops. And I had another girlfriend at the time and i'm telling my new girlfriend listen you just got to shut up man don't because th this girl her name was michelle she would come around the house once in a while just to visit before before the trial and she was scared and one time she came over and my new girlfriend was there and michelle came knocking on the door and i'm like oh no and my new girlfriend's like that's her you know, she's jealous. You know, the new girlfriend's jealous because the ex-girlfriend got arrested and she's got this bond with me, so this court case. And she goes, oh, she's always going to come around. And blah, blah, blah. I'm just, just shut up and let this thing pass, yeah. please. But this girl was so damn solid, solid than any gangster I've ever seen. She had, I had a new girlfriend, you know, she had nothing to do with it. All she had to do was say, you know what? He had this in the car. This is what he did. This is what he used to do. This is what I saw. And bam, it had been a fucking, maybe the judge wouldn't have had so much sympathy for me then, right? Because she's seen a lot of shit, right? But she kept her fucking mouth shut. Not a peep. Love that. So you get out, they have a big party. Uh-huh. What happens? Well, we have a big party out now of uh, Joe Sonkins. Who's that? Joe Sonkins. It's, uh, it's a restaurant. <clears throat> 
It's a, it was a really, really big mob hangout, huge mob hangout, um, up until Joe died. I think he died when I was in prison. But if you Google Joe Sonkin's Gold Coast Restaurant, this was the, if you were a mobster in South Florida, that's where you hung out. Like John Gotti was always over there. Every time Gotti came down to Florida, he went to Joe Sonkin's. Who's that guy that, uh, there was a news guy that used to stick a camera in people's faces all the time and follow you around back in the 80s and they broke his fucking nose. Sammy the Bull punched him square in the fucking nose. Uh, he's on TV now. J J J eh, a real prick. Anyway, he's on channels. He's on Fox News all the time. Gar Geraldo. Remember Geraldo? Yeah. You know Geraldo? Pestering people. Oh, man. He would follow people around with a camera, undercover Geraldo shit. Anyway, Geraldo went over there once when John Gotti was there while he was trying to have dinner with his, uh, some of his guys and they whooped his ass. <laughs> they whooped his ass with that camera and nothing happened, you know, back then, you know, nothing happened. But anyway, this, yeah, this, this joint, uh, Joe was a, he was a Jew, Joe Sagan was a Jew from Chicago. And he, he must have been indicted four or five times, never got him on anything. He was this quiet old man, I mean old, he was in his 80s. And he would sit in the restaurant with his dog, who was an ugly fucking dog too, it was an English bulldog. And the dog, no bullshit, if you see a picture, looked just like Joe. You know, Joe had those eyes that were so saggy and you could see the reds, right? Always with the cigar, just as old, old as can be, looked just like the bulldog. And he used to sit in the restaurant with the dog all the time. And uh, that's where, you know, that's where we had the party. And, and uh, Carlos was, I think Carlos was the only one. You know, the Italians all had money for me, keeping my mouth shut. But uh, there was a friend of mine, Carlos, who had an envelope with me, uh, for me for about 20 grand in there. So, you know, thank you. You didn't say anything, kept your mouth shut. Um, Did you start to feel like a little gangster then, prison? Dealing, making money. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't expecting that party at all. I mean, they blew me by surprise. I thought I was just going there to have a dinner. I had no clue anyone was going to be there. Um, I pulled up, my dad, my girlfriend, actually my the, the girlfriend picked me up from prison because my dad was at the bar. You know, yeah, I got to drive in the fucking prison to pick you up. So I'll go down there and fucking surprise. There's a fucking, it's like one of those things out of Goodfellas, you know? You got out of prison and da, da, da. But if you if you ever if you ever doing any mob search, check out Joe Sonkin's Gold Coast Restaurant. This place, in his back room, in his office, right? You go to his office. He's got a little elevator that goes up. This little rinky dink with the cage, like an old school elevator. It fits two people. You go up. You go up to the top, and it's loaded with whatever stolen booze, jackets, clothing, and that's that was that was the meeting place of a lot of the mobsters. When did you start getting involved with the bigger bits? With uh, cocaine? Let's see, so I was 20, I got out of prison around 2021, 20, I got bigger, bigger, bigger. We were doing a little bit of work, painting, I was on probation, and my brother had said something like, Hey, why well, you know, well, there was a there was a contractor that fucked us out of some money, right? A lot of money. We, we ended up we, of course we got the money, but I was like, you know, my brother said, you know, this fucking this is bullshit. You know, we're working our ass off and then this contractor screws us out of some money and why don't you make a f phone call down south and you know and he goes, You don't have to touch it, right? This is my brother said, but you don't have to touch it, I'll sell it. No, that rings a bell. Remember my uncle, yeah. right? You don't have to touch it. I'll sell it. Were you trying to go legit as well? Normal job and try to do the right thing? Yeah, I was at the time. At the time, <laughs> I, had, I, had a, I had a really successful painting company. I mean, I took, got out, took the license. I was, a, I was a contractor at the age of 18. I mean, a real contractor. So you were a business-minded business, business minded from a young age? Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I saw the money my dad was pulling in. He was pulling in. I was watching him one day writing bills, right? And he goes, all right, because uh, I did the work for him. I was on probation. He goes, 
What'd you do at this, at, the, at this bank, for example? Oh, we power washed the driveway. It took us an hour. Thousand dollars. I'm like, thousand dollars in an hour? Right? You gave me a hundred bucks. So when he's writing these numbers up, ba bam, ba bam, ba bam, ba bam, he would have been a multimillionaire. And from the bar, sitting at the bar, doing nothing. Just, you know, going around ordering it, da, 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 da. mob involved. He wanted a job. It didn't matter. We got, they got every paint job they wanted. You know, when, it, when a building's going up for construction or a repaint, for example, right? Let's say it's a $500,000 paint job on the beach. They want three bids. So let's say, let's say my dad comes in at 700,000. Someone else comes in at 600,000. The other one comes in at 500,000, right? The, the right number. So the guy at 500,000, he gets the bid. We lose the job. So they just find the guy with the, the, who put the bid in at 500,000 and say, hey, you better withdraw your bid. And the other one too. And they withdraw the bid, they always do. And that goes to the guy for 700,000. I just say, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't, I can't, and my numbers are wrong, and da 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 And bam, there you go. So now the mob just got made $100,000 just knocking on someone's door and did it all the time. In every business, they do it. So you're making good money then. Why even contemplate going down the other way again? Well, that's a good idea, a good question. So my brother, right? It's always someone else's fucking light well, bulb moment. Yeah, it was his light bulb <laughs> moment, right? But then my my greed factor is it's always the greed fucking factor, right? So my brother tells me, you know, we're busting our ass painting, and we had Hurricane Andrew just came through. You remember? I don't know if you know about Andrew. No, it, was like a, it was like an atomic bomb hit down there. It was flat. When I mean flat, there was nothing left. Nothing. The houses were just gone. So we got work for years. And then we did. We were doing this work. We we're doing work. We we're doing work. And we had all our money put in this one job. And this one contractor fucked us. So now I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs. And my my brother goes, "Why don't you just make us a, a call down south and we'll, you know, grab a, grab a quarter key, you know, grab nine ounces or whatever. I'll do it. I'll sell it. You don't touch it. If I get busted, I get busted." And that's true. He wouldn't he wouldn't rat on me. I wouldn't worry about that. I just had to get it. So then I, I said no a few times. And then one of the guys from down south contacted me. He leaves a voicemail on, on the old uh recording, you know, the old ones where you hit the button at the house. He goes, Hey, uh Murph, I'm here, blah, blah, blah. They cut my foot off. He comes up with this fucking story. I'm, they cut my fucking foot off. Call me back. Hurry up. I need your help. I'm like, I'm like what the fuck? So I call him back and say, hey, what happened? He, what, are you okay? What, what can I do? He starts laughing. They didn't cut my foot, foot off. I was just kidding. And I was thinking, fuck. My brother just asked me for a fucking nice. He goes, what's going on? I said, nothing. I said, well, I said, how's those girls down there? Are they still around? He goes, yeah, which ones? I said, the girls we used, you know, those girls we were fucking with the last time. He goes, oh, yeah, they're everywhere. Beautiful blondes. Pick your choice. You know, yeah, so we're talking in, we're talking in code, right? Girls are always bricks, always kilos. I said, all right, I'm going to come see you. Maybe we'll take one out to dinner this week. And he goes, all right, just let me know. So I go down there and, you know, I get a quarter keys, like what the nine ounces, nine, so yeah, nine ounces. And uh, I bring it back. And my brother's hustling. He's hustling. Bum, 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 bum. So he's kind of doing all the the work. And we're splitting it. So then he tells me, I got a guy that has a, I got a guy that wants a whole brick. Because we were kind of, we were kind of doing it. We weren't doing, selling like major shit, you know, grams eight balls ounces once around but nothing well, we're going to go too heavy that's what we tell ourselves <laughs> right that's what we tell ourselves and he um he tells me the story he goes i got my buddy butch it was a butch i think it was butch and butch was a good guy butch was good butch was solid always butch was always solid Mark goes, Butch, Butch has a guy coming down from New York. I said, hold on a second. You got Butch has a guy, and a guy has a guy, and a guy has another fucking guy. He goes, no, they're, they're good. They're good. They're good. I go, Mark, just, I said, listen. He goes, we're going to, we're going to meet at Bennigan's. That's a, that's a local bar. 
It's a chain, actually, like a Chili's. I said, I don't like it. I don't, first of all, that you're meeting in a parking lot. It reminds me of the fucking parking lot I was at. You go on with Butch and his Butch's friend. I said, if and he goes, yeah, but Butch knows this guy. Butch knows him. He's coming. The prices in New York are fucking crazy. Okay, I said, if anyone else comes, like his, it's always a cousin. They always say cousin. It's my cousin. If anyone else comes, you dump that shit, go to the, straight to the bathroom, and flush it down the toilet. Okay, no questions asked. So he gets there with, he meets his buddy Butch. And Butch, my brother gives it to Butch. Right, they uh, they're in the parking lot. They're just talking. Hey, da, da, look at this! I'm like, Fucking great. Okay, Butch Butch has it, has it in a bag or something. And so Mark does. He he doesn't even have it anymore. Right, his buddy has it. So they're gonna go inside, and they're sitting at the table. And my brother's just sitting there, and he's looking around. He said, "Man, this doesn't something. These people in here, they're too. You know, you can sniff cops out, right?" So he tells Butch, he goes, man, I don't know about this. This is something don't feel right. Now Butch is like, ah, come on, you better have a fucking paranoid, da, 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 da. So he's waiting for his buddy. And now the guy comes with someone else, brings in another person. And my brother was like, oh, shit. So Butch had explained to my brother because my brother was asking, who's your friend from New York? What do you know about him? What does he do for work? All this shit, right? Getting all the information out of him. He's telling him. So then the two guys sit down and he goes, oh yeah, this is my, this is my cousin. And my brother was like, oh God. He's, he's thinking, you know, what I said, if he's a cousin, you got your fuck. Get out of there if you can. So Butch and, uh, Butch and the, and the cop or something, they go to the bathroom to take a look at the stuff, you know, they're going to do it in the bathroom. Now my brother's sitting across with, from the informant and asks him some questions about his cousin. And, and Mark, he goes, he knew. He knew right there it was over. He's done. Because he said, you know what, I got to go to the bathroom. So he gets up. And he's ready to leave. He goes the other direction. He does it. He's leaving the restaurant. He's leaving the nine ounce. He's leaving the nine ounces fucking behind and leaving Butch in the bathroom. And when he gets out into the parking lot, fucking guns down, he goes, right? So he was supposed to call me at exactly 12, let's say 1230 on the dot, not 1201. I said 12, 1230, Mark 1230, because we've got shit in the house. 12.30, 12.35, he doesn't call, he doesn't call. I'm calling him, I'm calling him. No answer, no answer. All right, boom, I got to clean everything out of the house. I get everything out. Send it down the road, I don't know, we'll put it, hit it somewhere so the house is clean. Hours go by and I'm thinking, what? I know he's not there, so I'll do this. I'll call the police station. I call the police station, I say, hey. And she goes, Hallandale Police Station, can I help you? And I said, yes, ma'am, my brother just got arrested on the beach for fighting, and I need to know where they're taking him and how much the bond is, right, to get him out. She goes, okay, what's his last name? So I tell her, oh, his last name's Cayuchi, Cayuchi, and she checks, and she goes, oh, he's been arrested, but not for fighting. I said, oh, really, what is it? And she goes, hold on. And uh, Detective Dickwad gets on the phone. This is a detective so-and-so of the narcotics unit. I was like, yeah, yeah, no, you fucking cocksucker. I said, yeah, you guys got my brother? Yeah, how did you know? And I just, I just hung up on him, right? So I'm at the house waiting because I know they're coming. I'm outside. I got the door open. I'm sitting in a lounge chair in the front yard because they'll shoot you. Back then it was bad. They'll kill you. They'll kill you in the house and blame it on someone else. Blame it on the dog, right? So I'm in the front yard. I got a Coca-Cola in my hand. And, and uh, we were literally like two blocks from the police station. It wasn't far at all. Here they come flying around the corner into the front yard. I said, go on in, guys. Search away. So <clears throat> they didn't find anything. And my brother, he gets out. Well, he has to wait a little bit. His bond was like $250,000. It was up there because it, was, it hit that nine-ounce mark. I went from... 50, 50,000. And it, once it hits the quarter key, once it hits 200 grams, it goes up to 250. It was a lot of money. 
So anyway, he sat in there for a couple of weeks and got it knocked down to 20,000. And uh, what it ended up happening in his case is the snitch disappeared. So he got really lucky on that one. And instead of, you know, the th you know more than the three-year minimum mandatory, now he's, he was looking at, ten. it might have been 10. might have been a 10-year minimum mandatory because it was up there. It was either 10 or 7 minimum on that. So they, it's, the snitch disappears. My brother doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what happened to the snitch. And we know the snitch isn't going to show up. But he doesn't know anything much anyway. So he's in court. And I'm like, just take it, you know, don't take any deals. You got no snitch, you got no case. And uh, he ends up taking a probation. He takes three years probation or something like that. He goes, ah, I don't want to take a risk. I'll take the three years probation. I'm like, you shouldn't have done that. Because they can't produce, if they can't produce the informant, in the states, if the attorney can't question the guy that set you up, the case is dismissed. So what they're saying is they can't find him, but he could show up. Was it dead? Well, yeah, of course he was dead, but no one knew he was dead. But if you know, they're just hoping maybe he got scared or or whatever the fuck it was, right? They don't. They, he could show up at any minute. That's what they're trying to tell tell us. Yeah, he could show up at any minute. I'm thinking he ain't showing up. There's no fucking way he's showing up. So. Uh, he takes the uh, he takes the he takes the deal. I'm like, all right, take the deal. You want three years probation? Fuck it. But the problem with probation is if you get caught and you do something on probation, you're getting three years in prison, right? That probation just means there's you're doing your three years that you were gonna do in prison. You're gonna do them on the street. You got all these fucking rules, and if you get caught with a gram of powder, you get caught DUI, anything. You getting what happened? Fucking his buddy one day he gets, calls him up, says, hey, let's go out. And they end up going out. They get pulled over. His buddy had a, a bag of powder, threw it under, you know, they were getting pulled over. They threw it, he threw it under the seat, threw it under my brother's seat. And they both have it in the car. Now, my brother's on probation. The other guy's not. So he goes to jail. Three years. For that. Look at that shit. The other guy did nothing. Because it was like, that's oh, a gram. They're charging the other guy with a gram. No big deal. But he's got the gram plus the violation of probation. So now he goes to prison. For the gram? For the gram. It wasn't really the gram. It was the violation of probation. Because he had three years of probation on the street. You can't do anything wrong within those three years. And they found that gram, and that's all they needed. That's why probation is so dangerous. What about association back in the UK? If you're out in license or bail... Being surrounded by anybody who's active, you can then <clears throat> go to prison for that. Is that the same as the U.S.? Yeah, when you're on bail, <clears throat> when you're on bail, you can you if bail. I'm not sure about bail. Can they revoke your bond for associating with others? Bail, I'm not sure. Probation, they can. So it's the same then as U.K. So when you get out of jail, like I got out and I had five years on paper, I had five years to do. I can't hang out with anyone i know who's active a, cr a criminal right yeah or even a past felon don't have to be active you did your time you got a wife and family but you're you're you got a felony you're convicted if if i know about it i i can't do it i can't you're an automatic violation and that gets back to jerry chili remember i told you, you didn't give a fuck yeah. here he is he does 10 years he gets out they call him to new york what the fuck are you gonna do in new york you're 10 years in prison. You're a capo. They're calling you to go to New York to, to meet the family, to meet the boss. And, and you've got three years on paper. You don't get out. He's not free. He's on probation. Supervised release. What do they do? This fucking Anthony Gagliari, he was the, he was the parole or probation officer for all organized crime. He knew everybody, right? Most probation officers... When you got out of prison, you know, probation officer, they have two, 300 people they watch. Gagliari had 10, all mafia guys. That's all he would watch was mafia, mafia, mafia. He was like the FBI, this guy. He knew every, every way. All he had to do was see you and you, and he knew, boom. He's in the Colombo family. He's in the Gambino family. Dun, 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 violate. Take a picture. Finished, right? So Chili, 
He goes to New York, and Gagliari follows him all the way to New York, takes pictures. He just did a 10-year sentence, gets out, and he gets another 18 months. You know what he said? I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. He could have told him in New York, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. I'm, you know, I'm not coming. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they would understand. So you've been caught, your brother's been caught. Why did you keep going back to it? Well, my my uh initial because I remember I was I was talking to myself. What, what do they call it when you try to convince yourself of something? So anyway, I'm, I'm telling myself, okay, they caught me once. As a, but they charged me as an adult. So now that I really know that these laws are what they are, maybe I'll just keep it small. Then after the small went, I was like, you know what? It just it just got out of control. It got out of fucking control, man. <laughs> it was like it was insane. And and then you become all right, I'm going to just be fucking smarter than them. That's what it's going to be. I'm going to we're going to be so fucking smart and we'll kill anyone that has anything to do with cooperating. That was the that was the game plan. If, you know, cuz I knew if 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 you're if you're an informant and you're not there, then case over, right? Came over. And back, I don't know if you know, but in Colombians at one time could come to the U.S. and fucking kill people and go to jail for just a few days. And then they got sent back to Colombia. It was like, wait a minute, you guys got a pass. They had this, there was this deal, there was no, there was a, some sort of deal where they got sent back. So these people are getting arrested with a thousand kilos of cocaine. And the Americans are the ones doing the time. And the Colombians are getting sent, sent back until they changed the law. And then when that happened, boom. All the Colombians started staying here. You didn't see the wars on the street like they were. They were out there fucking killing people like like Star, like Star, Scarface. No bullshit. Brrr, okay, fuck it. Mm -hmm. Mowing people down. When did you start coming in contact with the Colombians? Um, after I got out, what was the... After I got out the second time, I... Got what happened the second time? I meaning the second time was, well, I got arrested as a juvenile. Mm -hmm. So I went to jail for a little, about 30 days, whatever it was, right? <coughs> then I went to prison. So that's the second time. It's really not the second charge. It's the second time I got out. So now I'm, I'm, I'm uh, talking to Car Carlos was my, my good buddy, really good buddy. He was actually the one that when I got caught, as a as a juvenile and i said carlos you know what motherfucker every time you give me dope i go to prison you start thinking he was a snitch yeah Probably. no i just said it was because i got all the dope from him like you know it could have been hundreds of kilos but if i ever bought it from this guy this one time i never got caught but everything you know it was just like a, a it was kind of joke between the two of us so you gave me the dope when i got caught when i was 16 you gave me the dope when i got caught when i was 25 and so anyway did he start moving up the ladder also carlos oh carlos was crazy yeah it was it was mostly carlos carlos was the one he, he all from that all from your uncle telling you to get an ounce no, from him no this the guy down here from down the end of the street was someone else we started with him and he was friends with carlos and as carlos i met him a few times you know we were all kind of and i was really much closer to carlos so Carlos was the one that he started, he was, he was in high school, selling grams, same shit, selling grams. I don't know what the fuck he, how he went from selling grams to this and, and then uh, working at, uh, we had, the, our, our, big, our big lick was American Airlines. That was the big one. Carlos called me one day. He's Carlos could he had connections here here and there, right? So and he's got kilos in the shit. And he calls me one day and he said, Do you know anyone that works at American Airlines that can get dope off of a plane? I'm like, well, dope how? How much? How much are you talking? He goes, I don't know, 100 keys. I'm thinking, all right, let me see. 
I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to some of the mobsters. I doubt it, my brain. I'm not funny because these guys don't know anybody at American Airlines. They're not really into drug smuggling. They won't bring it in, but they'll sell it if you have it or they'll rob you, right? But as far as bringing it into the country, that wasn't, that wasn't the Italian thing for sure. But let me ask. So he goes, all right, so I call Steve Maruca. Now, Steve Maruca, he's dead, so I could say these names. Otherwise, I wouldn't say his name. I call Steve Maruca. And I say, hey, Steve. Oh, actually, I had to call, call Chili first, Jerry Chili. Chili's in prison. How long's he doing? Is that the 10 he was doing? That might have been the first 10. Yeah. The first, yeah, because he did. <clears throat> so Chili's in prison. I call Chili. I said, Chili. First, I got to go down to the bar. I got to go to the bar. I got to see someone that can go see him personally because they go to visitation. So I go to the bar. I see the guy. This guy goes and sees him and relays the message. The message goes back to me. Be at your house at this time. He's going to call you on a landline. So Chili calls me at 9 o'clock. Hey, kid. He's got this real groggly voice. He always smug. What? What's going on? I said, I need to, I need to see somebody. And he goes, okay, go see Steve. And uh, that's all. They, and I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm over here with the captain. The cap He's in the captain's office using their phone. You know what that is? Okay, prisoners have their own phones that are on the wall that are monitored. He's in the fucking captain's office using the captain's private phone because he's chilly. And they don't record those calls. He goes, I'm in the captain's office. Don't worry. Say You can say whatever you want. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to say whatever I want. Just who do I, I got to speak to someone. So anyway, I end up seeing Steve Maruka. Steve Maruka, he was one of those guys that when you sit across, you know this guy, he's a killer. He's a killer. His, his eyes? His eyes. He's a killer. I didn't know it when I was five and six and four because he used to have a coffee shop. He had a coffee shop called Hollywood Diner. And I would go there with my dad in the morning and uh, he would make me coffee at five. And one day I asked for a Coke. My, my dad said, yeah, I'll have a Coke. And he goes, you don't let your kid drink that shit, do you? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, give him a coffee. He goes, you know how much garbage? He goes, look at this fucking box. He's got the fountain Coke, you know? He goes, read that. You see that? He's drinking that shit. Give him a coffee. It's the same thing. Caffeine, sugar, milk. This is going to kill him. And I thought, I was like, he's fucking right. Now, if you see a five-year-old kid now drinking coffee, they think you're out of your mind. In the States, kids don't drink coffee. That's an adult drink. But now it's kind of the teens, the lower teens are going to Starbucks and having their fucking fancy drinks. But before, no, you were looked, uh, looked at weird if your kid was drinking coffee. So he used to make me a coffee with, you know, I was like, wow, this is like, it was almost like a hot chocolate, but it was a coffee, right? So this was Steve, Mar the Steve Maruka I knew when I was, I was a kid. So now I'm sitting, I had other run-ins with him before. How many killings? How many killings? How many, how many people did they murder? Him? Oh, who knows? No clue how many he killed. He never got caught for any, but I know he, they called him the $5 button man. In other words... For five bucks, he'd kill you if you had a bad day. Not really. It was kind of a joke. But, uh, yeah, he'd knock you off. He uh, he can't remind me to tell you this story. He came to me once to try to shake me down when I was making money, right? He, hey, you know, you you, you got to pay or else X, Y, and Z is going to happen. And then I ended up telling him, listen, Steve, I know. I, I, I kind of blew it off. I kind of said, he goes, you know, people are asking about you and and – and they're going to come after you because you're making all this money. And I was like, and I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is him talking to me. This, there's no one else involved here. He's shaking me down. He's trying to do shake down. And I said, Steve, listen, I've known you since I was a kid and all this, you know, I was five years old. We went on and on and on. And I said, Are you tell anyone that wants a piece of me, they got to kill me. I said, look under the table. And I got, my, I got a gun there because I'm thinking, I don't know. Why am I being called to this meeting anyway? He goes, oh, so you're all growing up, huh? And I says, yeah, you know, but I said, Steve, I appreciate, you know, I just kind of spun it to like, I appreciate that you're looking out for me, telling me, you know, people are asking about me. I said, but if they want me, they're going to have to kill me. But I'm not kicking out a dime to anyone. As soon as you start kicking up, you're fucked, you know? Then they want more. This guy wants some. Uh, so anyway, he. The word got out that he tried to shake me down and they all laughed at him. They said, what the fuck are you trying to shake down the kid for? Because they all know me from when I was a kid, 
fucking giving him drinks at the bar. You know, he was, I had a bad day at the track. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting down with this, the same guy, Steve Maruka. And I'm like, Steve, you know, anybody at American airlines or, or in Miami or Fort Lauderdale, they can get bags off. He goes, what for? I said, he goes, Oh, really? I go, yeah, there could be some good money in this. And, uh, I'm talking, he goes, well, how much? I'm like, uh, you know, you could probably put a couple thousand dollars on each kilo. A hundred kilos, you know? So he's like, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll ask around. And I'm thinking, it's never going to happen. But he calls me in a week. I got someone. I'm like, what? He goes, all right, let's meet. So we meet at... Denny's back at the same spot, and he's got this guy there, and he goes, all right, here's so-and-so. He can get him off. And he, we tell him, all right, we're going to put him in, I think they said they were going to put him in the food. Originally, was going to go in the food carts. Originally, that was the plan, I believe. It ended up going in the food carts, but the original plan, Carlos said, we're going to stick him in f the food carts, you know, where they come down the aisle and they give you your desserts and shit while you're on the plane. Shit was going to be full food carts so he goes no don't put them in the food carts put them in suitcases i'm like okay uh he goes and i go how are you going to get it off he goes oh, i'm just going to grab him on the plane i'm going to fucking get him off and i'll give him to you in the front of the airport i said steve let me talk to you for a second here i go how well do you know this guy he goes i he's good he's going to walk on the plane grab the dope and just walk out of the fucking airport and hand it to us just like that he goes, that's what he does. He's a baggage handler. So I'm talking to him. I said, how do you do it? How do you do it? He goes, it's, he goes, nobody's watching. I take this one. I put it here. I take this one. I put it here. I put it on the back of the thing. I go, no. He goes, nobody's watching. So I tell Carlos, let's do it. And he goes, just put it in two uh, Samsonite, and let's say red suitcases. And we'll, that'll be that. We'll have the numbers on the tag number so he knows exactly what it is. So, boom, on, off, just like that, right in front of Miami International. He says, come get him. He pulls up in a little golf cart. He's got the suitcases in the back. Here you go. Bing, bang, boom, done. Unfucking believable Just like that. But they were short. The kilos were short? The kilos were short. How many? Oh, there wasn't short kilos. It was short grams. Yeah. This was, this was, this was the thing. And I was like, I weigh one. First you, first you do the check, right? You get the thing, you do a quick count, bang, bang, bang. Then you got to open it and hope, hopefully you don't have half fucking cocaine and half powder or all fucking powder. Because people do a switch from, from Columbia to how many hands it gets involved in. Mm -hmm. And there's people that switched them out and these guys got flour. And a bunch of dead people coming. You know what I mean? It happens. So I'm like, okay. We were. I got I got the bricks and I told him we're short. And he goes, How much? And it ended up being about, was it two or three kilos? And he goes, What about your end? And I go, I I don't know my end. 100%. I can't vouch 100. Could be. I can't see why he just wouldn't rob the whole fucking thing if he wanted to rob us. Right? Yeah. Just take off. You got 50, 100 bricks. Take off. No. We're going to find out. So he goes, all right. I go, what about your end? He goes, oh, let me check. So what he does, he saw them put it on the plane. He knows, he knows how many hands it goes through. And what they do over there is they just do a roundup. They say, fuck it. If there's 10 people involved, we're taking all 10. Was it not sealed? Oh, it's sealed. But if I give it to you and I say, all right, I'll see you in a week, all they do is they cut a little piece out of the corner, mm. right? It's all wrapped in tape, right? Yeah. They put a, cut a little piece out, take a couple grams out, wrap it with the same exact tape. You never know. It's just tape, tape, right? You can't tell. But when you weigh that motherfucker, let's say with all the tape, it's, it's a thousand, you know, a thousand thirty, and then ends up being a thousand twenty-eight. UK, there was always an ounce, just under an ounce shot every kilo, always. And then someone's getting robbed. Yeah, 
That's a lot. It's 28 grams. That's what I'm saying. Skimming a few grams here and there, you wouldn't, it's nothing you would complain about, but when it starts going two and three kilo, mm -hmm. it's a, how much were you paying a kilo? Uh, for that was probably, by the time it got there, it was probably $10,000. wasn't much. By the time it got there, they're paying for them back then, 1500 2000 then you got to pay to put them on the boat. Now you got another two thousand. Now you're four thousand. Then you got to pay to get them off the boat. And then you got to pay. The, you know, you, it it ends up being by the time you get it, maybe eight to ten thousand dollars in your hand. And now you're selling them for fifteen, eighteen. And if they send them up north, twenty five, thirty, thirty five, thirty. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the shit was coming into Miami. Was the big thing down there. So. So you're still making few hundred grand million pound every delivery yeah you make a lot of fucking money <clears throat> the problem wasn't do they turn a blind eye to the two or three grams look down in the labs they can fuck up you can take a you know they gotta weigh it out scales off by a gram all right because they're weighing it they're packing the shit in the forest somewhere right that's what they're packing it they're not in some elaborate laboratory they're underground in the fucking jungle using these old ass scales and hopefully they're on point right but when you start seeing three grams four grams and that shit starts adding up he goes all right no because they know when when they why over were you weighing them because it was still felt like a kilo or did you just know uh, no because they got numbers over there and i got numbers over here so, this one so just to double check the numbers double check the numbers yeah and sometimes it would even write on the outside 1021 or 1000 you know and they'd, they'd put these uh, numbers on there sometimes not all the time mm -hmm. but they'd say all right here's our numbers da, 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 da. i'm like uh-uh this shit ain't this ain't flying it ain't right so they round everybody up of 10 people he knows he's going to kill one of them already this was this one fucked up he knew he was going to kill this guy because he had done something already in the past so they round them up they take them out into the woods and they put their they put rubber tires over them and he starts asking okay here's what happened we're short somebody's robbed us i need to know who it is if you don't talk you're all dying and you're all your family's dying everybody your mother your kids every we're killing them all okay so it goes to the first guy now this this was the the, the, the psychological warfare here is this guy was already on the hit list, but nobody knew it. So he goes to the first guy. The guy's innocent of this, but guilty of something else. What happened? Did you steal the dope? No, no. Light him on fire. <laughs> now you got nine other guys over there watching. This guy on lit on fire. Is this Columbia? In Columbia. All right. So must that's a bad scene, huh? Imagine being the other fucking nine. Hoping. You know, one of them has to say yes, or you know, you're all you might as well even look, even if you didn't do it, if you're going to save your family, yeah. I mean, it's one of those situations you're fucked. After he lights the first one on fire, guess who confesses? His own fucking cousin, his own cousin. Now, he had no intentions of taking out his cousin. He was just there just to be part of the nine. He was like at the end of the line, you know? No intentions at all. So his own cousins go, it's me, Primo, Primo, let me talk to you. Let me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Da, 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 da. Now the other eight that are left, they hear. And uh, he goes, please spare me. And, da, 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 da. and he goes, I'm not gonna, what do you say something like, I'm not gonna waste my, I won't waste something on you. I won't waste a bullet on you. He goes, if you confess, that what he said, if you confess, I'll, I won't light you on fire, I'll kill you. Or something, yeah. If you confess, I won't light you on fire, I'll put a bullet in your head. So he confesses. And he goes, I'm sorry. And he goes, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, don't worry, I won't light you on fire. And he goes, so and so, boom, shoot him. Basically, kill him. So he ends up whacking out his own, own cousin. And then he calls me and goes, I got the guy. It was, it was on my end. And I was like, oh, really? So, and yeah, that's that's how it went. How long did you do that for? How long did you get a good run? And was it just all through the airlines? Yeah, I got a good run for, let me see, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 four years. 
about four good years. What was your biggest shipment? That came through? Probably the biggest one I can remember and the one I was involved in was about 2,000 bricks. They had one for 12,000. They had 12,000 bricks. Then we lost one for, it was in the thousands. How do you lose one? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. How you lo well, we lost the cops. Well, as you call lost, they didn't like dis disappear. Oh, so right? they showed up? Oh, yeah. So we were outside, we were outside uh, the airport, right? And we were watching the plane land. We got binoculars and we're like far away. Like, like all right, we're going to watch it unload. What's that feeling when you're watching it unload? Are you just thinking? Yeah. Here we go. Coming in your pants. Fucking, <laughs> we're having a fucking party tonight. <laughs> we're having a fucking party tonight. So you're watching it, and here, and, and here comes the plane, and then suddenly it gets fucking surrounded by cops. I'm like, oh, man. That never happens. You know, they, they got it right there. So that was a tip off. Because usually if it's, usually if it's, if it's a snitch, they're not going to do that. They're going to let it go from point A, and they're going to watch it, and they're going to arrest someone. Someone just called and said, you know what? There's 2,000 bricks on this airplane. And that was, it hung up the phone because they don't, there's no one to arrest, but at least they can seize the dope, right? And sometimes it's a way to get out of prison. I'll tell you that one. Uh, but these guys get out of prison by sending dope on purpose. It's cooperation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's cooperation yeah. without getting people in trouble. Yeah, anyway. People used to do that, I think, back in the UK. They used to tell someone to get guns. I know mm. what guns are, mm -hmm. but they didn't just get somebody to leave a bag of guns and yeah. they would get a reduced sentence. Right, right, right. So, you know, you're cooperating, but you're not putting anyone in jail. You see, now the mafia See, I don't mind that. I don't mind it either. I think it's genius. It's business, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually genius. You're using, you're using the system that they designed against them, right? Now, in the mob, you can't even, you can't even sit down and talk to a prosecutor. You can't, period. It's against the rules. If you do, you're a rat. Even if you're talking about something you did, you did only me. Say, I only did this by myself 20 years ago, and here's the guns that I left, and I was working with the cartel, right? If I did that, you're, you're a rat in a mob. You're done, you're out, right? Now, there's reason for it because when you sit down and cooperate, you can, when you're done cooperating, you can tell the, the mob, oh, this is what I said. I said this and I said that, but they don't know what you said. Now, now if you never sat down, they know for sure you didn't say anything, right? But the Colombians, man, they, they got some brilliant ways to get out of jail, brilliant. You have 5,000 keys, come on, just take me. And then make a phone call, send this guy. Send these people that actually get caught. They want to get caught. There's people with brain tumors in Colombia dying, right? And they've got no they've got no health care. They live under a banana tree. They're gonna die. They got cancer. All right, stick him on a fucking plane. We'll put 10 kilos in a suitcase. He's gonna come to Miami International. They're gonna be waiting for him. They're gonna arrest him. They're gonna take him down there. He's going straight to the hospital. Right? He's gonna get 10 years. He's going straight to the hospital. They're going to save his life. And he's going to live better in prison than he lived in the Columbia anyway. So those are the ways you get people, you know, that's how you get your sentence reduced without telling on your friends. See when you got the shipment, see when the shipment gets caught, who's, who pays the price? Is it, do you half it down the middle? What, you still owe them or do you have to still pay full? Uh, usually it depends. If you order from them, right? If you order from them and you lose your shipment, that's on you. Once they put on the boat, it's all yours. That's it. Now, now once it gets here, and let's say I get 100 keys, right? And I get busted. I don't have to pay. They don't care over there. They put on the boat, and you, it, you own it. And they actually did a, they used to do a little scam in Columbia where they would put it on the boat. And then they would intercept it themselves. So they put on the boat, 1,000 kilos, put on the boat it's on its way they'd have someone else come fake police take it off the boat now they now they're getting their money off that and this Double it, up. they just stole their own dope back and the middle guys are like so so basically you just got to know who you're dealing with because they will do it when does the greed kick in the greed yeah always it doesn't <laughs> stop <laughs> the greed doesn't stop. 
<clears throat> if you put this number in your head, right? All right, I'll stop it. A million. And you're like, fuck, I got a million. If I had two million, I could do this. And then you're like, all right. Now, a few million dollars is, to me, should be plenty. But man, when you start, it depends how you live too. Carlers, for example, he's a funny character. If you ever go to Colombia, I get you, you can get a lot of people. Uh, and his English is perfect. He talks like, well, your English isn't perfect. Mine. Is <laughs> 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 Carlos would need a translator with you. He's like, what the fuck did he just say? But he grew up in Miami, so he's he since five, so he, he speaks like I do. Um, but he would have a rough time. But uh, if you ever go to Colombia, man, you could get some really good stories over there. If uh, you might need a translator for some people, like they speak only Spanish. But he was so bad. Talk about power hungry. This guy, he at one time I think he had about sixty million dollars stashed in in the, everywhere, just inside the walls, and he had five. We called he he was funny. I got my he goes oh I'm going out with my wife tonight for example he goes I'm going out with my wife tonight I'm like oh okay and then uh, in the next sentence he goes oh I go who are you talking to. Oh yeah, that was uh, Sherry, my my wife. I said, "Wait a minute!" You told me your wife was Lisa. He goes, "No, it's my other wife." I go, "How many fucking wives you got?" He goes, "Well, I got five. I go, you got five wives. You can't have five wives. That's not legal." He goes, "Well, they're I call them my wives because they I, they, I bought them a house. I gave them a car. I give them money every fucking week. They got credit cards, so they're my wives." He goes, but I'm married to actually one person. So talk about, yeah, he was a, uh, he was a real, a real uh, power power getter guy. Nice, nice as can be. Yeah. But he got caught. Believe this, he got caught with no drugs. He did his actual charge. I was in Japan on the run. I was in Japan on the run, and he got caught money laundering some stupid stupid thing he's like this guy's brought in thousands of tons of cocaine on american airlines alone never got caught never got caught american airlines was great and they knew who he was but they just couldn't get him you know he's just like one of those guys he brings it in and all right you take 100 keys you take 100 keys and this thing that you, you, people see in the movies where okay i'm going to bring 100 keys and you bring me the money for 100 keys that never happens i've never seen it happen i give you 100 keys to call me in a week you bring in the money right anytime someone brings 100 keys and then you know a few million dollars for the money i mean for the dope now you've got that's where the greed kicks in well who brings the guns brings home everything right you don't give a person a chance to kill you i'm going to give it to you you get to walk out the door without shooting me but if there's an exchange of money and drugs now everyone's nervous you're going to give me the money and i'm going to give you the drugs and then i shoot you and then i take it all see i give you the drugs bye mm -hmm. when you're ready call me and then just here's twenty thousand. here's I'm, I'm da, da, da. so you know the uh the idea of the Hollywood, we're going to meet at a warehouse and there's going to be all this. No, that doesn't happen. You just give people dope. And if it gets lost, lost meaning they get busted, if they really get busted, it's a clean slate. They don't, you don't owe them. The only thing that you owe them is shut the fuck up. That's it. So you're making millions. Everything's going sweet. When does it come on top? Oh, this was a beauty. Um, Did you have an inkling? Did you have any feelings? Oh, or were you just so caught up in your own? No, I had, I, I had a feeling. I had a feeling <coughs> after this one thing happened. Were you doing a shipment every week, every month? Uh, usually, at least once a month. Usually once a month. And my dad, this, this, this is what got me. My dad had called me and said, he said, I need to talk to you about something. So I said, what's up? So I, I meet my dad and he goes, hey, I got a guy that could take 50 keys a week to start and I'm like, first of all, right there, right there, I was like, no. Nobody asks for 50 keys a week from someone they don't know. Just, you just, it's not, 
why, why don't we start with one? Okay. So I said, Dad, this doesn't sound right. Nobody asked for 50 keys off the rip. And I said to him, I said to him, how's it going to go when we, for the 50 keys? They're going to bring us a few million dollars, whatever the number is. They're going to bring us a million dollars. And then we're going to bring them 50 keys of someone I've never met before. And then someone's got a newsie and kills everyone and walks out with everything. Or are they going to give us the money first? And then we go get the 50 keys. That's not going to happen. They're never going to let the fucking million dollars go. And I'm never going to give a stranger 50 keys. So now we're, uh, we're at a standstill. There's no deal. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. So he goes, well, let's just go and make the meeting because I told this guy, what was his name? Sal Sanzaro. He was the owner of Hemingway's. Hemingway's is a famous restaurant in Hollywood. Another mob hangout. So Sal, Sal or Paul? Sal, Sal tells, uh, tells my dad that he knows someone that can take 50 keys a week. And my dad tells Sal, and my son knows all these guys down here, so let's make this thing happen. So I tell my dad, I said, listen, at this meeting, you tell Sal, we do not mention the word cocaine. Do not mention the word cocaine. We're gonna talk about diamonds. And diamonds only, we're talking about diamonds, okay. So he says, all right. So we go to this meeting and it's Sal, a guy named Mario Adamo, another guy named Alex, and my dad and me. So we're sitting in the re this beautiful restaurant and Mario comes in, Sal, Sal's there, Sal talks to me. I know Sal, I've met Sal before. Sal tells me about my grandfather and how I was a little kid. I used to sit on Sal's lap. I used to go behind the bar and I used to make all these drinks and shit. I don't remember any of this, but he's telling me all this stuff and uh, that him and my grandfather were best friends. And all right. So then he explains to me about Mario. Mario's used to be married to my daughter. So his ex son-in-law, I said, okay, that's fair enough. And Mario, you know, he's good. He did 15 years in prison. Keep his fucking mouth shut. Da, 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 da. All right, good. So Mario and this other guy show up. And introduces Mario. Mario's uh, Italian with the accent. Hey, ba, da, 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 like off the boat. The other guy instantly, I was like, oh, no. This guy's not good. I could tell. Radar. This is Alex. I go, who's he? He goes, oh, he's the driver. Yeah. I said, uh, what do you need a driver for diamonds? And they look at me like I'm, like I'm fucking crazy. What do you mean, dry diamonds? I said, we're here to discuss diamonds, right? And then Mario looks at Sal and goes, what are we talking, what the fuck is going on here? We're here to discuss merchandise. We need, you know, we told you we need 50 keys. I said, ho, oh, you got the wrong fucking person here. You guys need to straighten this out. I'm a diamond dealer. I don't deal with drugs. I don't want anything to do with drugs. I." whatever listen i Matt, sal i'll give you the money you can deal with them i'll give you the diamonds you can deal with them but drugs leave me the fuck out of it i said pops let's go so we walk over to the other table and then they first first they go what do you think we're fucking poli uh, police and i said it doesn't matter if you're police i'm not doing anything wrong I, i'm not a i don't do this business so sal tries to like squash it and he's like uh, let, let me talk to let me let me talk i'll fix it so anyway, we go back and forth. We finally sit back down. And uh, Mario's telling me that he's got, he used to have a supplier that they could do 50 diamonds a week. And if, if it goes well, hundreds every week. Every week, like clockwork. And I say, okay. He goes, but we, we just, we just don't, our supplier doesn't have it, or whatever the bullshit excuse was. I said, all right, Sal, uh, Mario, explain this to me. In your fantasy world, how would this go down? Because you've been doing this for how long now? Because I've been doing this for 15 years. I said, all right, you've been doing this for 15 years. You're a professional diamond dealer. Explain to me how a deal of this magnitude from someone you do not know would go down. He goes, well, we would come here to the restaurant with the money and you would have your diamonds and you would bring them and we would look at them. And then if we agree on the quality and everything, 
then we would, you, you would go your way and I would go my way. And I said, really, just like that. I said, you're going to bring a million dollars in cash to someone you don't know. And if I have a gun or if you have a gun, what happens? Someone's going home with it. Everything. I said, it doesn't work like that. That could just show me you have no idea what you're talking about. You haven't been doing this fucking 15 years. You're, you're full of shit. <laughs> you're full of fucking shit. You have no fucking clue what you're doing. And this whole fucking thing stinks. He goes, what are you saying? I'm saying something's wrong. You calling me a fucking rat? I said, I don't know about you, but this motherfucker right here, this is a fuck. He's a fucking rat. I'm telling you now, because they introduced me as his driver, my driver, fucking driver. So I said, that's not how it works. I goes, if you were to ever do a, a, a deal like this with someone you don't know, here's how it would work. Hypothetically, I'm telling them, hypothetically, in a fantasy world, I would have maybe one diamond and I would say, take it, take it to the jeweler. Check it out. Sell it. Bring me the money. You bring me the money, I'll give you another three diamonds. And we do that a few times until we build up the trust to where I could say, hey, here's a bag of diamonds. Fucking see me next week. Because I know you got the money and I know you're coming back. That's how it works. Oh, there's too much risk. There's too much risk involved in driving around and that. And I said, you're worried about driving around? I'm worried about fucking 50 diamonds. I said, that's why I know you're full of shit. And then we left. I said, Dad, they're no good. There's something fucking wrong here. So my dad's like, <clears throat> my dad smells money, right? My dad's a... He, yeah, why did he not... Why did he go he, with that? Because he's, he's got the... He's got the... The greed, right? He's, he likes to gamble. He's, he's got the gambling... Uh, so it doesn't matter what he's doing. He's just trying to get money to yeah, fix that habit. Yeah, yeah. He loves it. Yeah, he loves it. He's a schoolboy. Yeah, yeah, it's a gambling. And a lot of mobsters gamble. A lot. I mean, they make all this fucking money and they blow it. And they fucking do this, they do this and that. Yeah, Gotti liked to gamble as well. They do. Yeah, yeah Gotti, like, I think, was putting 160. He was putting 10 grand bets on the NFL, but 16 games, so 160 grand every weekend. Now, I, you know, one thing I never did figure out about gambling is you have a million dollars, right? You're going to lose. You always lose. The house always wins. Always. Yeah. So what's the point? I, I, you, you know, when you're a millionaire, what's the point of gambling to make another $20,000? It's it's a dopamine hit. See here? Yeah. It, it's like, it lights your brain up like Las Vegas. It's a dopamine really? hit. Really? So they're paying for the hit. It's like, so it's equivalent to placing a bet. It's equivalent to taking heroin. I, you know what? Because it fucking, it's the brain. It's a dopamine chemical. It's the right. buzzing out their tits. It's it, nothing to do with winning or losing. It's the feeling. <clears throat> there was guys from Japan that used to go to Vegas, multi-millionaires, and they'd do $100,000, right? So you win 100000 bucks, but you have $100 million. How does that make you feel? To me, winning hundred grand, losing hundred grand, if I was a, had $100 million, I wouldn't give a shit. I wouldn't yeah. enjoy it. But what you're saying is some people have that winning that even if it's $100,000, it's a big thing. Yeah. It's not the money. It's the, it's the buzz. It's the buzz. The pain for the adrenaline kick. I never, I was never a gambler. Never, never, never. Maybe it's because I watched my dad gamble and he yeah. used to fucking, like you're saying, John Gotti's doing, you know, 10,000. He's doing on NFL Sunday, fucking the grand. He's putting a dime, a dime, a nickel, a dime. I said, like, what is that? He goes, that's a thousand dollars. I'm like, wait a minute, let me add this up. I have fucking $30,000 over here. Crazy, crazy amount of money, but uh, that's what they do. So that's so my dad ends up going, and I said, "Look, pops, you want to do it, you do it. I'll do it with you." But these guys, I'm telling you, he goes, "Let me just let me do something with Sal. Sal's the owner of the restaurant. Sal, Sal. I've known Sal. Sal's in his sixties or seventies. He goes, let me do something with Sal." I said, all right. And he goes, what do you want to do? He goes, we'll do one brick. I said, I'll give you a brick. I'll give you a kilo. It was like 17000 or 15000 something, whatever. He goes, well, how much do I sell it for? I said, put $2,000 on top of it. He goes, yeah, really? He goes, 2000 I go, yeah, 2000 And now I can see he's doing the math. 50 a week at $2,000. Oh, my God. He said, fuck, if you could do 50 a week at $2,000 on his end. So he goes over. And right next to this restaurant is the VFW. So I park at the VFW. I walk in, give my dad my car keys. I said, it's in the trunk. He goes, grabs the bag, 
walks literally 100 feet to uh, Hemingway's. He goes into Hemingway's, and there they're meeting Sal, Mario, the Italian, and Alex is there again. I didn't know this part. The Alex, they told me that Alex, had, they got rid of him or something like that. So they have a conversation. My dad comes back 20 minutes later. He got envelope. It's 18 grand in there or something like that. All hundreds. Is it? Maybe it's not the feds, but maybe it is. $18,000 to the feds is nothing. They give you 18000 So weeks go by and we're still negotiating. My dad's negotiating. And I have a, I have a, a meeting with, with Sal one time and I'm like, Sal, this this Mario guy, the, the Alex guy, I don't, did something wrong with the Alex guy. I'm telling you now. And he tells me, oh no, the Alex guy's gone. They got rid of him for something. He did, I mean, he just made a story up like uh, some shit. I said, so who is it? He goes, it's me and Mario. And Mario used to be my uh, son-in-law. I said, all right. And I talked to my dad and I said, dad, you want to do this with, with Sal? We'll do it with Sal, okay? I said, Sal, listen to me. You own that restaurant? And he goes, yes, I own the restaurant. I said, if something goes wrong, we're taking the restaurant. We're taking it. There's no questions. I don't want to hear blah, 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 blah. The, the restaurant <coughs> belongs to me. And he goes, deal. I said, so we got collateral. So I make a phone call, and there's no dope in town. It's like around Christmas, all these fuckers take vacations yeah, in Columbia. There's no fucking dope in town, right? So Carlos calls me and he goes, I got, Carlos calls me and he goes, I got some dope. Do yeah. He goes, I got some dope, but it's not that good. All right. He goes, I got some dope, but it's not that good. And I go, really? He goes, yes. But someone brought it. They've got it. I don't even think it was his. It was a friend of a friend. He goes, but if you want to come take a look at it. So I went and looked at it, and it was, it was you could tell it was, they, they stored it in something. They didn't, they weren't, they were 250 gram miniature kilos. So four of those made a brick. Like they stuck them in some sort of furniture, you know, like a table, and then put the wood around them. And then, so it looked like something like that. So they had four made a, made a brick. So I, I took one, took a sample, and brought it down and gave it to Sal and said, this is what they got. So he goes, he went out, wanted a price, and he goes, all right, I'll have, uh, I'll have Mario take a look at it. Well, they came back, and they go, they want it. And I'm thinking, why the fuck would they want this? It's garbage, because there's nothing around. He was right, there was nothing around. So I said, all right. And he goes, they want, they want 50. I said, well, I'll give you seven. I'll give you seven. And then after that, we'll do this and we'll go, bop, bop, and we'll go back and forth, okay? Because I know he can afford seven. So I go to his house and give him the seven. And I say, call me when it's done. Why were you driving with it? Why did you have it in your possession? Well, I, I you know, to, I, I wasn't really, I was, didn't bother me. Didn't really bother me to drive. I wouldn't drive 50 or 100. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Seven, it was a quick one. Uh, but that particular day I did, I drove the seven, no big deal happens and risk, risky, risky, risk taker sometimes, you know, that's your own buzz. It could have been, <coughs> it, it, it could have been the uncle with the coke addiction, your dad with the gambling addiction, you're getting your buzz through. It could have been, could I be caught? Could I not be caught? Uh, 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 you could be right. And I never even thought of that my whole life because there was some risks I took that it's either that or you got to. Listen, here's how it goes in this business, and I've, I've learned this one. If I have someone else drive it, and he gets caught, he's going to tell on me, right? 90 fucking 5% of the time, they want the money for driving. You know, usually to pay someone to drive, something's a 1000 the key, right? So someone's going to get seven grand to go from Miami to Fort Lauderdale, for, for, right? Around the 500 to, to $1,000 a key. But if they get caught, Number one, they're going to tell me. Number two, they could drive in the other direction. Right? 100 bricks. All right, I'll meet you. There. You know, they know where to go and they make a detour. So there's a few reasons that, uh, but this one was 
probably, I don't know why, I just fucking did it. But yeah, you're right. I liked it sometimes. Because I had a man, Andrew Pritchard, he was UK's drug smuggler. Uh -huh. He used to get three, four thousand keys from Jamaica. Make He was in Jamaica, he was married to Miss Jamaica, uh -huh. making millions. But he missed something back in the UK. So see when they were shipping the gear from Jamaica, he used to sit with the car around the fucking corner. Just wanted to be there. I wanted to be there. Just to make sure when the trucks were driving through, that because they used to give the customs one million. Uh -huh. You can take a shipment every other month, but as long as you let five or six through. Right. But he used to watch them bring the shipments through, so it must have been the buzz of. Oh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's good. When you're watching that, when you're watching, it's, it's your product, man, and you're talking a lot of money. Yeah, Dude, millions. It's hard to sleep. <laughs> you know and just like all right you're gonna go to bed for eight hours and wake up and what what happened no i want to see that shit show up i don't want to hear because you hear every excuse in the fucking world oh we got raided oh really well fuck i was watching you you didn't get raided so it was it was a small amount but enough to put you away for a long time mm -hmm. um but yeah you're probably right because i did a few that i shouldn't have so the seven kilos right so he gets the seven kilos and I leave. And he gets the seven kilos and I leave. And I tell him, call me when you're done. They're supposed to be there at 12 o'clock. I told him I'm going down. I'll be down in Miami or some shit. But I wasn't. I was down the street. He calls me at 12, fucking 10 or something like that frantic oh my god they robbed me help come over quickly quickly i said well who is this i just completed cool this guy said, who is this i said sal sal hurry up help me they robbed me they robbed me i said sal what are you talking about because at this point it's either one the feds or two it's a real robbery and if it's the feds they're listening to the phone so i'm like, sal what are you talking about because they took the dope they they, they robbed me they gave me the bag of rocks and, and nothing blah, 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 blah. I look, so I'm busy. I'm, and I played it as cool as it can be. So if that, that was on tape, I was like, this guy just got robbed of seven keys and he's like, you don't even care. Right? So I look, I'm down, I'm down in Miami. I'll have to call you later. I'm thinking, oh, fuck. Is it the feds or was it a real robbery? So I decided not to make any phone calls, you know, because you don't want to. That's, that's exactly what the feds are waiting for a phone call a threat show up at his house yeah they're there they're watching every fucking thing they're who the fuck knows where they're at they could be on the fucking fly's ass with the camera you don't know why they're, they're watching you so you gotta you gotta play these when it when it comes to this shit nice and quiet um so a little bit of time went by and we we did i you know, ended up meeting him at his restaurant but it, there was never a time where i said all right i'm gonna come here at this time i would just show up you know and find out what happened to him and he's like yeah this they, they robbed me and he said it was he goes that alex guy i said what alex guy i thought you said alex was gone he goes yeah they said he was gone i said that was a fucking cop i'm telling you he was no good he goes i gave it to my he goes mario pulled up mario looked at the at the at the bag and he said, give it to the car behind me, which was Alex apparently driving the car. He walked back there and gave it to him. And, and he goes, well, where's the money? And he says, well, Mario's got it in front. And he goes, ah, uh -huh. he's an old man they're dealing with. So as he walks back towards the other car, they both leave. So he gets ripped off. So now I go, Sal, you owe some very, very serious people a lot of money. And we need the restaurant. So you need to sign the restaurant over right away. So I went to my attorney and I said, hey, draw up the papers to this restaurant. We're taking it. How much was it worth? A half a million bucks. Not bad. For seven kilos? Well, yeah, not bad. What ended up conspiring was we went to get the restaurant. And at first, Sal didn't respond very well to that he kept he kept making these fucking stories uh i'm gonna do something else oh i got another deal and i go what do you mean you got another deal he goes we're bringing in heroin i go are you fucking retarded with mario the same guy that you just well it wasn't mario that ripped us off it was it was alex mario's my brother-in-law he's he he's not the one that ripped us off 
I said, so let me get this right. You're gonna you're gonna do a deal with the guy that you just lost all this fucking money from to recover money to pay us back. I said, you're fucking stupid. I said, we're coming to get the restaurant. So we go back and forth a few times, and the attorney. How did this go down? The attorney draws up the paper, and. No, first there was a meeting. Okay, first there was a meeting. There was a meeting at the attorney's office, and it was Sal and Mario. Alex wasn't there. And it's me, Sal, and Mario. And we're sitting there, and the attorney is going to do all the paperwork. So I'm thinking, all right, if Mario's an informant, he's going to have a wire on him. All right. So Sal and they come in, we're sitting at the table, and... He says, look, there was a business transaction between you two and you owe him. You agreed to put the restaurant as collateral and da, 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 da. And then Mario starts interjecting stuff about drugs. Listen, we got ripped off. We're doing another deal for X amount of heroin. And he's right in front of an attorney here saying this shit. He's a family friend attorney. And I said, listen, motherfucker, I don't know anything about drugs. I said, Sal? I gave you cash, right? And I fucking I like kicked him under the table. I said, I gave you cash, right, Sal? You gave, I gave you $120,000 in cash. That's what you got. If you bought drugs with it, that's up to you. Uh, and now fucking Mario starts, from, what are you talking about? He's going, ah, nah, 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 nah. And I go, Sal, would I give you cash or, or cocaine? He goes, Mario, Mario, he gave, he gave me cash. He gave me cash. Let me handle this. Let me handle this. Right? So Mario's slipping out because he's not getting the right words on tape. And the attorney jumps in and goes, listen, there was a business transaction. You agreed. It fell apart. You put your, you put your uh, you, uh, restaurant on collateral. We're taking it. And he goes, okay. So he goes, I'll, I'll, the attorney says, I'll draw up the paperwork. You come back tomorrow and sign it. Sal says, okay. Sal, trying to be slick, reaches out to some Columbos. Okay, you know the Columbo family? All right, so he reaches out to the Columbos. The capo down here at the time was Joey Flowers, Joey Rotuno. So he reaches out to Joey Rotuno. In the meantime, we're not getting any, we're not getting any fucking, we're not going forward with collecting this money. So the Colombians decide well i called the friend to uh i said listen we need someone over here that can shake someone up really good he says all right this is what we're going to do it was a valentine's day sal's not oh nowhere to be found nowhere he's hiding but i know he's in this fucking house i said we'll get some flowers knocking on the door and this is funny joey flowers is uh, his name is well joey Fletch. joey flowers was the colombo guy that they're actually that, that he reached out to, right? He reached out to the Columbos to try to protect them. So Joey Flowers has a shop, flower shop that I know of. He's got a flower shop. So I go to Joey Flowers and I order a dozen roses for Valentine's Day. So the Colombian sends a really good guy over, knocks on the door, he's got his flowers. Sal answers the door and he goes, for me? Valentine's Day? He goes, yeah. Open the door. He opens the fucking door and boom, down goes the gun. So he's in his house and he's got the gun, drags him to his fucking room, puts his head on the fucking bat and on his, on his knees and he goes, motherfucker, you're done. And he had a revolver. It was, it was clever. Bzz, click. Fucking shits his pants. Let the, make a long story short. Has a fucking heart attack almost, right? Shitting, crying. He's playing Russian roulette with him. He goes, you sign those fucking papers tomorrow. He goes, one more shot we're going to give you. If God wants you to live, he will. If not, you're signing tomorrow. He puts a bullet in, spins it, but it's got no firing pin. Clever, huh? It's got no fucking firing pin. Bzz, sticks it in his mouth. You ready? Click, boom. Uh, I'll sign, I'll sign, I'll sign. So he brings him back to the fucking kitchen, ties him up, and he, it's a, he makes a sandwich. So 
He, uh, the he Colombian made the sandwich? He makes the sandwich. The guy's he got the guy tied up. He goes, what do you got to eat, man? I'm hungry. So he makes himself a fucking sandwich. Just everything because he's got a restaurant. Get the pasta. Get the this. Get the that. <laughs> so he calls me. <laughs> he calls me. To the, to tell him not to come. Please don't send them anymore. No, no, no. You just send the Colombians to my house. And I'm like, Sal, what are you talking about? What Colombians? They, they came. They came. They came. They're going to kill me. They put a gun in my mouth. I said, Sal, I don't know anything about any Colombians. I didn't send anybody over there. You owe people, you owe people. Me, I have nothing to do with it. I kind of backed out and said, I got nothing to do with it. It's in the Colombian's hands, right? Well, he fucking quickly after that reached out and, and he actually did sign the papers over. But prior, when, when he signed the papers, okay, he signed the papers, he gave them, we gave them to the attorney, but right before the attorney filed them in the courtroom, here comes fucking the mob going to the attorney's office. And they go and they sit in his room, they sit in his chair and they do the fucking thing and they tell everybody to get out. And they go, hey, I hear you're, you're taking Hemingway's. He goes, yeah, I'm taking Hemingway's. He goes, well, you're not taking any more. He goes, and who the fuck are you? He goes, my name's Joey Flowers. Ask around who I am. That restaurant belongs to us. Okay, that's our place. He goes, all right, I'll let the kid know. Maybe me and me, I'll let the kid know. He goes, you tell that kid if he wants to talk to me, here's my number. And the attorney was good. He goes, don't worry, he'll find you. <laughs> How's it going, right? <laughs> so my attorney calls me. He goes, hey, we got a problem. I go, what is it? He goes, you know Joey Flowers? I go, yeah, I know this guy. He goes, he just came, came to my office and basically threatened us not to file those papers to take to the restaurant. I said, really? He says, it's his, and there's nothing we can do about it. I said, okay. So I go down to Hemingway's because apparently they're claiming it belongs to them. I go down to Hemingway's, and it's he's there with some big fucking guy. And I go, hey, Joey, it's, uh, it's, my name's Cayuch. He goes, ah, so you're the one. I go, yeah, I'm the one. He goes, come on, let's have a take a seat. And I go, go ahead, sit down. And he gets in the booth first, and I sit right next to him, like really close to him, like uncomfortably close. And he's got a goon here, and I tell, tell the fucking goon to take a hike. And the guy looks at me, I said, take a fucking hike. He goes, I go, listen, we got no conversation. So he goes, go ahead, sit at the bar. So I'm talking to Joe. And he goes, you know who I am? I go, Joe, I know who you are. I know you are. You're well respected. I go, Joe, do you know who I am? He goes, I don't give a fuck who you are. I say, see, that's the problem. I said, listen, I'm Italian. You're Italian. I know the rules. I said, do you know the rules of the cartel? Because I don't give a fuck about the cartel. I go, well, let me explain something to you. This is how it works. Italians. No women, no children. You got all these fucking rules that you can't do. I said, the cartel, you know what they do? They kill everybody. They don't care. They'll kill you, your wife, your kids, your goldfish, anyone that gets in the way. They don't care. They really will. You could see he's getting nervous. One thing you'll never see the Italians say is that they're not afraid of the cartel. One, and, and, and that was another big mis one of the reasons later on that they didn't want to get involved with, with the cartel. If you ever notice, like John Gotti's crew used to sit outside that fucking restaurant in New York where, where they would just sit out, they, they were all there at the same time, and they all do it. I got to meet you over here at the coffee shop. Every morning, same place, same time, you got the whole family sitting there, right? What happens if you piss off a cartel? Just go down and blast every cut. All of them. You take a wipe them out in one second. What's the repercussion? What are they going to do? What can they really do? Nothing. They're in Colombia. You're going to go hunt them down in the fucking jungle? You might knock off a couple of their local people, maybe. But trust me, they're going to wipe all you out first. So Italians know this. You don't deal with the certain people. And the Russians. You got to be really careful with the Russians. You don't, They don't want to go to war with the Russians. You know, it's more like the Russians will come here and say, hey, we're going to take this and you guys have that and we'll make a deal. And they're going to be like, okay, we'll take the deal. You know? 
So that was my that was my meeting with Joey, and I said, "Look, this is what's going to happen. If you try, you'll lose. You will lose, and everybody will die." And I explained upset. I said, "Listen, this is what they'll do. They'll put a few guys on a boat. They'll come over here. It might take a month. Nobody knows who they are. They'll find you. They'll whack out everybody. They'll get back on the boat, and that'll be it. And you'll be what you'll be out of business." So it's like, okay, let him try. So now I'm thinking, oh, okay. So that, I didn't get far with him. So then I'm thinking, all right, the Colombians will do this. I don't want a bloodbath, right? I don't want a bloodbath. I'm going to try to get the fucking money back. So I think, hmm, let me call my mob friends, right? So I go back to the same bar and get another message to Chile, who's still in prison. Okay. He goes, what's up, kid? He calls me at my house. I said, oh, I got a problem. I got a headache. I need to talk to you. He goes, all right, go see uh, these two guys this time. It was Steve Maruka and another guy who's still alive. So I tell him, hey, we got a problem. He goes, what is it? I said, uh, I got to be I gotta be honest. It's, it's drug money. Right? You got to lay it on the table. This is drug money. This is nothing. He goes, all right, okay. Are you now? You could see him. They go like this. Are you selling the drugs? I go no. They they owe. He goes so. There's no drugs involved now. The drugs are not in. The, we're just collecting, right? I said yeah. You're just collecting. He goes okay. No problem. He goes well. What happened? So I tell him the story, and he and I go Joey Flowers. He goes Joey Flowers. That fucking mutt. So Steve Maruka didn't like him at all. He was out going. I'll shoot him myself. He goes listen to the other guys. He goes listen if they don't pay. We're just going to go in there like the wild, wild west, and we will blow the place up. This is Steve Maruka talking. And the other guy's like, well, why don't we try to do this? He goes, no, 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 let's just shoot everybody. Now, that was Maruka, the, the hit man, the fucking crazy guy. I'm thinking to myself, holy moly, these guys are, these guys are out of their fucking mind here. They're, you know, so we, uh, they they have negotiations. They're going back and forth and back and forth. And they have a, they call me into a sit down. And it was me. It was me, Joey Flowers. Yeah, you know, I better not tell the story. Um, so... We go back and forth, and the f the outcome was either the mob is going to go and do something crazy, or the Colombians are going to do something crazy. But thank God, something else happened in the mint in the in the interim, where right, all this is you know, going here, going there. I start noticing I'm getting followed, and I was I picked up my mom one day to go. Where was I? I was going to I first, well, first I had a girl I had a, I had a girlfriend of mine who worked with the police station and I got Mario's license plate number okay the Italian guy and I said run this plate so she runs the plate and she says there's nothing it doesn't come back I said, that's odd she goes but an address comes back but the address doesn't exist so that's even weirder she's got a Porsche different car on a license plate so I knew something was fucking fishy there and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, feds, 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 feds. And I even told the mob, I said, listen, it could be the fucking feds. This could be a trap. I said, think about it, guys. They robbed the money. Feds, you know, you guys come in. We do, this can happen. That can happen. You kill everyone. And now what? You got cartel. You got the mob. And they're like, well, fuck it. So you guys know. They didn't care. They didn't care. So I started to care a little bit more about they fucking cared. And they were going negotiations back and forth on who uh, who who was actually there. They were saying they had $100,000 in the restaurant. The Columbo's owed, owed it. The Bananas were saying, no, he's with us. It's ours. Da, 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 back and forth, back and forth. And then as all this shit's unfolding, I'm in... I was 
Oh, I picked my mom up one day. This is just a quick side story. I picked my mom up one day and we're going to Christmas shopping. It was right around Christmas. She goes, you're being followed. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, that car has been behind you since. I'm like, all right. So I, I pull through the, a driveway and I go here, another like a parking lot, and this car is following me. So I go down, take a right, do a U-turn, still fucking follow me. Go over a bridge, stop at a red light. I get out and I knock on the window. I go, hey, I'm going to the Aventura Mall. He goes, oh, no, I was just, I said, motherfucker, you've been behind me for the last 10 minutes. So they were following me. My dad calls me and tells me, come over for lasagna. Go over to his house, lasagna. All this shit's still pending, right? All of it. I had a couple state cases too that, not a big deal. This guy, I had two other charges that were, after my child, the kid charged when I was 16, I had two more charges pending. I got it set up by some fucking douchebag. But I wasn't worried about that because we were going to get him. So my mom says, you, you know, being followed, I get behind the guy and I said, hey, I'm going to the Aventura Mall. He goes, I'm not following you. I just, I'm, I'm lost. Da, 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 da. Then my dad invites me over for dinner and I'm there with my buddy. We're eating lasagna, da da da. When we're done with lasagna, it's about nine o'clock at night. I go downstairs with my my buddy, and we're in the parking lot, and I see two guys sitting in a fucking car, and they're in their seats and they're laid back, like way back. And I'm like, we're being followed. And he goes, what? And I go, put your hands up. Let's spar. Let's spar. So when they were like, we're boxing, I go, we're gonna circle. Look over my shoulder. He goes, oh fuck, I see him. So now I know I'm being tailed. Let me just check something real quick. Okay, now okay, now I know I'm being tailed for sure. So I'm like, oh fuck. But they don't do anything. They leave me. Next so that night I go down to Miami. Now I've got in a house. I've been in a house condo. I've got, what was it, 100 keys or 50? Two suitcases full. Probably 50 keys, about 50 keys left over from a shipment, right? Sitting in the closet. I'm just hanging out waiting to see where we're, where we're, where we're going to put them. My dad calls. Well, oh, first I'm talking to a girl on the phone all night long. My battery dies. Battery dies on the phone. There's a rule. Do not ever use... If there's a phone, a landline to call out. Remember back in a year now from here, they had Star 69. Star 69, if I call your house, right, and you don't answer, you pick up your phone, you go Star 69, and it tells you who was the last phone number that called you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Instant trace. I think ours was 1471 right. in the UK. So it's an instant trace back to the last phone call. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a house with dope, you don't call anybody because if the cops go to that house and they go Star 69, they know the last person that called it, leads you. So I'm asleep. I go to bed. About seven in the morning, my dad beeps me, 911, 911, 911 on the, on the pager. I'm like, oh, shit, what is this? So I'm thinking, oh, shit, he's, he's back in the hospital because of his liver. He was bleeding. He was, you know, alcohol. I have no phone. My battery died, my cell phone. So I have to use the landline. So I use the landline and I call my dad. I said, what's, what's up? He goes, I'm being arrested. I was like, oh shit. I just used the landline and I got fucking 50 keys here. I go, who's arresting you? He goes, Hallandale police. I go, whew, thank God. It's not the feds. I go, what are they arresting you for? He goes, I don't know. It's uh. Uh, they won't tell me, the, but but they want to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, sure. The cop gets on the phone. I go, what's up? He goes, listen, we got to take your dad downtown. Uh, I don't, we don't know what the arrest warrant's for, which I thought was weird. But can you come down here and secure the house? We don't want to leave it empty because, you know, people see us taking them out in handcuffs. Someone can come in and rob the house. Well, that was logical, maybe. He goes, I said, yeah, I'll come down. It's going to take me an hour to get down there. I'm about an hour away hour and a half. 
So as I'm driving, I'm thinking something doesn't smell right. It smells fucking, they're arresting him, but they don't know why. So I did what I did before. I called Hallandale police and I said, hey, my dad's getting arrested. Um, can you tell me where he's going and what do they, what do they arrest him for? So she goes, let me check the warrant board. On the warrants, they go, we're not arresting your father. We don't have any arrest warrants for him. It's not us. Call the sheriff. So I called the sheriff. They said the same thing. We're not arresting your father. I'm thinking, either he's getting kidnapped or it's the feds. So I pull in to my one of my like my ex-girlfriend's house. I said, I gotta use your phone at seven in the morning. She goes, What's up? I said, Bad news. I call my attorney, because I got two pending cases. I said, Hey man, I've got uh you need to you need to find out there's an indictment. Are these people are arresting my dad. Is it is it the state? Is it the feds? He goes, If it's the feds, it's a sealed indictment. It's sealed. We, we I can't open it. They won't tell me. It's a sealed indictment. I said, listen, cocksucker, you just, I pay you a lot of money. Make the phone call. So I call him back five minutes later. He goes, man, they just couldn't keep their mouth shut. They, you got an indictment. I go, what is it? He goes, you got seven kilos of cocaine. I was like, oh, God, there it is. The feds the whole time. This is almost a year later, almost a year. They were waiting for the fucking, either the cartel or the Italians to come in and fucking kill everybody. They just sat back and left everybody fucking guinea pig. You believe that? All for seven key. Yeah, well, they were a lot a lot more would have happened. It yeah, was at seven key. with a conspiracy to 50 because that was, the deal was we're going to do a 50 kilo deal. So that so, was, they put that on the indictment? Yeah, it was seven. It to 50? Seven, with the, yeah, there was two, there was two charges. Set possession with intent to distribute uh, seven kilos, conspiracy to 50, because there was a conspiracy charge. So that was in the indictment. <clears throat> was, Sal, was Sal in on it? No, Sal wasn't in on it. He just seems amateurish as fuck. Fucking Sal wasn't in on it. In Why? On. How do you feel not going with your gut feeling? What are you gonna, I knew it. You know, we'll, we'll get in hindsight 2020, right? But if it wasn't that, it would have been something else. When did you, so you ended up in the run in Japan, is that correct? Yeah, I got away, but I, yeah, I, you know how many times I got away from the cops? Fucking seven. It's unbelievable. It's 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 insane. How did you get out of the country? A fake passport. Called Carlos. I what, said, what year was this? Ninety five or ninety four. So not, you never had chips and all that shit. None of that then. shit. Yeah, None yeah, of that nine yeah. nine eleven shit. I called Carlos. I said, listen, you got seconds to make a decision. He goes, what happened? I said, the feds. Now. I'm on the phone with my attorney and they think, he tells me, you got an indictment. The cops at my house, my dad's house, those are the feds. They're waiting to arrest me with everyone else. So now I got 50 keys at the other place that I, I called from that phone. So they're going to end up finding it. So I get back on the phone and call my dad's house and I call the cops. I go, hey guys, you just sit tight. I'm on my way. I'm in traffic, but I'm going the other direction. I said, please don't leave. They go, no, no, we're not going to leave. We're not going to leave. So I'm, I switch cars because I'm in a different car now. I tell my girlfriend, meet me, the, my real girlfriend. I said, meet me at the gas station. Give me your car. I fucking, I was at one girlfriend's house making a phone call. Called the other one to get her car. Switch cars at the gas station. Go back to the hotel. And I'm like praying. I'm like, okay, please don't be there. Don't, don't be there. I pull up into the valet, open the trunk, pull my keys out and take the elevator. So my car stuck in, in valet and they can't move. I didn't give a shit. It was only gonna be up there for five minutes. Take the elevator, run up there and I'm like, I put the key in the door and I'm like, I say a quick prayer. I said, please don't be full of cops. And boom, no one there. Grab two suitcases. Now I go down the fucking fire exit, right? Like 11 floors, it was hard, 100 pounds. Fucking exhausted by the time I get to the bottom, I'm fucking dying. I throw the dope in the back of the car, shut the car and I'm, I, I drive out and I'm, you know, it's like a one street. And as I'm going this way, the lights are coming. I can see them. They're coming this way. And I'm shitting in my pants, but I'm in a different car now. So I wasn't a gold Toyota 4Runner. Now I'm in a black Toyota Celica. So I'm sitting at the stop sign and, da -da -da, and I just go forward and I see him. You had regular cars and you had the black uh, Fed cars and you could see fucking FBI and DEA and all these motherfuckers. And they're going, and I'm looking out the rearview mirror, and they're going, and they're going. 
And I called Carlos. I said, listen, either you have someone meet me now or this shit's going in the dumpster somewhere. Now, you got to, what's Carlos thinking? Hold on. Is he setting me up? He doesn't know. This was, he had one minute to make a decision. So Carlos got to decide quick. I got to get, I got, I got fucking, this dope has got to go somewhere and I'm not taking it with me. He goes, okay, go meet the guy, the skunk. He had a white fucking stripe down. I said, go meet the skunk. So I meet the skunk outside a, a Subway sandwich shop. Here you go, two suitcases and off I go. Then I get a fake passport. Right, he gives me a fake passport, and I end up, I end up going to Disney World to have to wait for a few days to cool down. Why are you there? Because there's a lot of foreigners, and you know, thousands of people. How are they going to find you in Disney World? You got to be. If you get found in Disney World, you're fucked. You're a moron, right? <laughs> you got millions of people in a crowd. How can you be found? But my buddy that I went up there with, it was really solid. He's on the bed with a couple chicks. And he's wrestling and fighting and, and shit. And the girls don't know what's going on. They just think we're in Disney World. And he's playing and they're screaming and I'm in the shower. I don't hear this shit. And I get out and I hear on the door, boom, 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 police. And I'm like, I'm fucked. Cops got us. That fast. How the fuck did they find me in Disney World? I go, we hear it screaming and shit. And I go, ID, ID. So I got a fake passport. That's all I have. And I don't know if it's good. Was it in the system? So he takes it and he takes it down to the car and okay, have a good day. I'm like, holy shit, this passport's solid. So I took the passport and hauled ass, went to Mexico. Then from Mexico, I went to Hong Kong. Then from Hong Kong, I went to Taiwan. And in Taiwan, I mean, I did some martial arts over there. Met some really powerful people because the one martial arts instructor that I was with, one of them, was the teacher for the Chinese Police Academy. And when they had me, they had me in handcuffs in Taiwan at the airport. On the way out, I was leaving Taiwan and they arrested me. And they're going through my bags and shit and I'm thinking, oh, I'm screwed. They got me. Internationally, they got me. They got the passport. They're trying to pull the, pull the fucking plastic off and I go, what the fuck are you doing? But they're not saying anything. They're down, ching dong, ching dong, ching dong, ching dong. So they're photocopying it. They go through my bag and they got a business card of my Kung Fu teacher. And it's a Chinese police academy uh, chief instructor. And they look at this and they go, How'd you get the card? He said, oh, He's my Kung Fu teacher. And he goes, Oh, he's a Kung Fu teacher too. I was like, Yeah, it's my Kung Fu teacher. Can we call him? I said, Please call him. They called them, they were fucking ching da, 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 da. Boom, <laughs> off came the handcuffs. <clears throat> off come the handcuffs, bow, fuck, escorted me to the airplane. How the hell was that possible? What were they looking for when they pulled you? I don't know. It was, they said that my, I had overstayed illegally, but then I fixed it all. I fixed it all. My papers were completely clear. When I walked through that airport, I wasn't going through an airport dirty. My visa was, was intact and everything. But they said, you stayed here too long. There's something wrong. What are you doing? We have all these millions of questions. And I had a ticket that said, Japan, California. I bought that California ticket on purpose in case something happened at that airport. I had a bad feeling, one of those feelings. So when they're yelling about, da, 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 you haven't been back to America in five years and this and that, I said, then send me to California. I got a ticket. I said, stop the bullshit. I don't want to go to Japan. I was going for 10 days anyway. Let's go. Send me to California. I was trying to call their bluff plan. Please don't send me to California. Don't send me to and then they found, that, they, they found that business card. And I was like, oh, Jesus. Saved my life. And then you ended up in Japan? Then you ended up in Japan. How did you get caught? How I got caught, I don't know. But I got caught. <laughs> I got caught about, there was no, after three years, I was in Tokyo for about three years. And one night I came out of a club. I mean, I was in deep in Japan. We were dealing with the Yakuza. And uh, there was the, 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 most of the drugs were coming from the Iranians. You believe that? Iran. Not Iran, the country, but the Iranian people. They're like, they were able to get into Japan easily, very easily, just like on a passport. 
and just like like uh, like in the states, you know, the Mexicans can come in and just like that, no problem. They give them temporary shit. Well, the Iranians did it over there, and they come from Iran. They have nothing. What are they going to do? So, they they were the ones that actually introduced cocaine into Japan in the nineties, early nine, not early early nineties, but not yeah, maybe early nineties. So you were still working while you were in Asia. I wasn't. What do you mean? Well, yeah, yeah. When I got to Japan, not Taiwan. No, Taiwan with death penalty. It's on your passport. Death penalty for drug traffickers. I said, well, I don't want nothing to do with these people. But Japan was more like states. It was wide open. You could do what you want. But the people controlling the drugs was not not the Japanese in the area I was in, because it was all foreigners. It was called Rapungi, right? It was tons of foreigners. Japanese didn't speak English. They didn't know who was a drug dealer. They had no fucking clue. So the Iranians were, co were covering all that, uh, all the drugs, Iranians and Israelis. Then I get there and I find out that a gram is going for like $150. I was like, $150 a gram, 150000 dollars a kilo. That's a lot of money. It's insane. So I made a phone call. I said, Carlos, you ain't gonna believe this shit. And he's like, what? I was like, 150,000 a key. He's like, what? I said, yeah. So I started small over there to see if I can get to the big. And there was a problem with the Iranians at first and they wanted to kill me. That was it. There was like a fucking, this guy came in and in a matter of two weeks, days, I bought a cell phone, met a few English guys English guys love their powder. A few English, Australians, you know, all the white guys. And the laws were so different over there. You know, what's funny is Andrew Tate said something about the laws in Japan. He said that the conviction rate in your interview, the conviction rate is so high that it's almost scary. But there's a reason for it. Because the Japanese don't arrest you unless they've got you so by the balls, there's no getting out of it. There's absolutely no getting out of it. There is no informant. You can't wear a wire and set something. You can't do that in Japan. The only way for them to get you is if a police officer gets you. You know how hard that is? So now, it's not an informant setting you up. It's you dealt with the police officer. You're convicted, pal. There's no, there's no getting around that. If they raid your house and it's full of drugs and you're not in the house, guess what? It's not yours. Even if your fingerprints are on it, it's not yours. You weren't there. So this is why their conviction rate is so damn high. And their crime rate is so low because they don't report most of it. See? So it's kind of like that. So because when they caught me, they seen me throw a bag of dope. I had to have couple grams, probably 50 grams, let's say, had a bag. We were partying. It was party night, right? 50 grams. Boom. Oh, they seen it. It's on video. Me throwing it. A scooter with 50,000 ecstasy pills in it. Okay? With my ID. With my fingerprints on it. During the arrest, because they didn't catch me with anything on me at all, laws in Japan, they can't question you about anything except for what you're arrested for. I was arrested for trespassing because I ran so fucking far and threw the dope, threw this and threw that. I had nothing on me. So during my interrogation, all they could say was, why did you run? And why, you know, why did you do this one? And they, they can't by law ask you about anything outside of your charge, which was trespassing. And I'm thinking, Damn, there's a scooter there with 50,000 pills in my fingerprints and my ID. If they find it, I'm fucked. So I got my girlfriend visiting me in the Japanese police station, but I can't talk to her directly. I got to go through a Japanese lawyer. And I said, Is the, are, the, are the rules the same? The laws the same? Well, if I tell you something, it's between me and you, not me, you, and the police. You know, oh, no, same as America. Same, same laws. For bullshit. So I write this letter to my girlfriend in detail, all in code, like crazy code. Only she would get it. I don't care. No one could. The feds didn't even get it because the FBI was there the whole time and they didn't understand what the fuck I was saying. But she did. 
So I give the letter to him. He copies it, gives it to the feds, and she gets the letter, and she comes back and goes, Scooter's not there. Scooter's gone. I've looked with the Japanese guy, which was a friend of mine, Kawana. She says, it's not there. I'm like, the Scooter's got to be there. I said, talk to the girl with the tattoo on her arm. She's like, I talked to the girl with the tattoo on her arm, and we went to the park by the club, and the Japanese guy knows exactly where. It's not there. So now I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I'm like, fuck, I'm getting charged with 50,000 pills in Japan. You know what that is? You're fucked. And then uh, like on day 21, they bring you into, it's like the prosecutor's office. And I'm like, are you being charged with trespassing? Guilty, guilty. Don't let's not even go farther. Guilty, I don't want to hear anything else. And uh, that was it. They, uh, the whole time they were cooperating with the feds. And I had no no idea. So the feds were there, but the Japanese, they used the Japanese police to try to try to manipulate me. It was pretty clever. How, when did you get back home? Did they extradite you? They didn't have to. <clears throat> they were, you know, I could have fought it, but I wouldn't win. I used to in a Japanese jail. So, yeah, they, they sent me back. Yeah, extradited me. How long did you get? Ten. Did, did they ask you to cooperate? Oh, yeah, of course. And yeah. you stayed strong? Yeah. And the ones that wanted to get me on, because I was, there's a there's something called the st statute of limitations. So from the time of the crime to, they have to arrest you within X amount of time, right? In the States, it's five years for, for the charge I had, right? I was gone four and a half. All the dope I had came from Carlos on that case. So here I am. I got six months left, statute of limitations. And they want to know, you know, where'd the dope come from? Who, you know, they knew who it came from. And I'm like, and you got to be, you know, these these people that scream and holler at the fucking fuck you. You don't talk to cops like that. You be gentlemen. Say, gentlemen, you got You do your job. Let me do my job. I'm not out. You know, I I take responsibility. I'm not out to hurt anybody else. You know, if I could help you, if I could help you, I really would. If I could, but I can't. So, you know, let's just you know, take it easy on I me mean, if you can. You know. Be a gentleman, you know, and that's that's what I did. And I went to prison, and I ran into Carlos in prison. He was there. He got caught for money laundering. So we were all there. All three of us were there at the same time. It was kind of kind of odd. It was me, Carlos, and the other kid that they were kind of buddies. And this motherfucker here, he had got caught. I was, let's see, I was in, in 2000, it was me first. And then he, the other kid gets caught, the Cuban, you got time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Cuban, uh, the Cuban dude gets caught. And this is a wild, this is a wild story. I'm in prison. I got my 10 years. And the one Cuban kid that was down the street with my uncle, remember him? He was, he's still hustling. He comes and visits me a couple times while I'm in prison. Eh, he's telling me all this shit he's got going on in, in Tennessee. Tennessee. Tennessee doesn't play. Those certain states, they will fuck you up. You know, you get five years here t fucking Tennessee. You get 500 years. They don't play in them, in them redneck states. So he's telling me he's doing this thing and he's bringing 50 to 100 keys down to Tennessee every week with this guy named Tyrell, and I knew Tyrell. Tyrell came to Japan, and I told him, this guy's gonna snitch on you, I'm telling you, he's no good. He told me, Tyrell told me, I'll never go to jail, because I will kill myself if I have to go to jail. Anyone who says they're gonna kill themselves, instead of going to jail, means if you're too, too much of a pussy to go to jail, you're too much of a pussy to pull the trigger, right? You're not gonna kill yourself. <laughs> you're not. So I told him, anyway, long story short, he ends up getting caught. The guy, Tyrell, tells on him. And he gets, uh, he gets like 20 years. He gets a lot of time. So what does he do? He starts telling, he, he actually sends a message to me in prison. He says, tell M Murph, my, my nickname. He says, tell Murph to expect some visitors. Like, what the fuck does that mean? I expect visitors. I'm in. I already pled guilty. They can't charge me with anything else. When you plead guilty, you plead guilty to this and anything in the past. 
right? That's it. You're clean slate. But I never told him about Japan. I kept, I don't know. So these fucking, I get a call and the feds are there. I report to the fucking whatever office it is, uh, captain's office. Or so I got federal agents sitting there going, okay, and they're from Tennessee. Yeah, the Tennessee Bureau of Invest, the TBI, two rednecks. And they're showing me these pictures of the Cuban guy with my ex-girlfriend, the one I stopped at her house to use the phone. I remember she was a nice Cuban girl, really nice girl. So he goes, I go, what are those? Go, you know that he's dating her? I said, get the fuck out of here. I said, listen, don't start with your bullshit manipulation. Try to get me to fucking flip on someone. These pictures are bullshit because it was her in the back of the seat of a limousine with him. And we did that every year for New Year's. That was the thing. The Cubans would go out New Year's, take a picture. I take a picture with his wife. He takes a picture with my girlfriend. So I said, I, I probably took the picture. They go, no, this picture is like two years old. You've been on the run for four. I said, I'll buy that shit in a million years and fuck off. This motherfucker ends up pleading guilty to uh, 20, it's 20 years. And he ends up in the same prison as I do. So I'm walking down the thing one day, and he goes, hey, Murph, and I look. I go, motherfucker. I said, come on, let's go for a walk. I said, you know the feds came here talking shit about Japan, and they were talking about Japan, and that you were you're sleeping with uh, Noelvis? And he goes, yeah, what's the big fucking deal? I said, what? I said, what do you, what do you mean you're sleeping with Noelvis? Yeah, she was this, that, and the other. And he, she, she got indicted with him. I said, what, what the fuck you got? You're dope at her house? Yeah, she worked for me. I said, you, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I want to fucking kill you, you fucking scumbag. So then, Carlos is in the prison with us too. So now it's me, me him, and Carlos. Have they put you in, put you all in there for a reason? And he's all getting no, we're, we're all, we're all, on just... we're all in the local, we're all, you're arrested in Miami. You're going to either Coleman or Miami, unless they're going to send you far away because you're a snitch and they'll separate you. But since nobody actually cooperated on each other, you're allowed to be in the same prison, right? Mm -hmm. So now Carlos is getting all these questions. Or he's getting called in, right? He's getting called into the, the, uh, the captain's office too. The feds are asking him questions too. And Carlos is thinking, well, how the fuck do they know all this stuff? Well, this motherfucking Cuban dude is telling Carlos that I'm the one talking. So I go in the rec yard one day and I'm like, hey, Carlos, what's up? He's, I'm like, what? So, you know, I thought, bad day. So a few days later, goes by. I said, hey, Carlos. And, motherfucker, I can see him moving his mouth, motherfucker. That's <laughs> 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 nice. nice. I catch his ass walking, walking down the fucking thing. Say, hey, 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 Carlos, come here, motherfucker. He goes, what? I go, you got something to say to me? Say it to my face. And stop all this nonsense. He goes, no, I got nothing to say to you. I said, if you do, you come see me. I'm over here in B4. Anything you got to say, anytime, any place, I'll meet you out in the rec yard. He goes, all right. The next day, he comes looking for me. He goes, hey, Kikus, let me talk to you. I got to tell you something. It's bothering me. He said, meet me in the rec yard. I said, all right, what's up? He goes, he goes you know, Fat Man says you, you're, we call him Fat Man. He goes, Fat Man says you've been talking to the feds, you're talking about me and that they've been calling me down to the office and all this other shit. And all this stuff they don't know. I said, really? I said, Carlos, when I got arrested when I was 16, did they ever come see you? Right, you gave me the dope, right? He goes, right. I go, the dope on my case, this case here that I'm in prison for, did they ever come see you? He goes, no. I said, I was in Japan. I was in the States. I was, in, I was gone for four and a half years. I came back. I had six months to take you down and the Cuban because he fucking drove. He was involved. All three of us were involved in the same small little seven kilo deal. I said, I had six months to take you guys down and I wouldn't have been here for 10 years. I'd have been here for two years. 
And he looked at me and put his fucking head down. He goes, it's that fat motherfucker. I says, that's fat motherfucker, right? He goes, that dirty son of a bitch. I said, he's telling on everybody. I said, the feds came to me and they're asking me questions about Japan. Shit that only he would know because he went to visit me there. I said, it's, it's, it's him. And he said, he'll take down everyone. So then it was get back time. He had told me, he goes, he goes, make sure this fat motherfucker doesn't know me and you were talking. I want him to think we don't want, we don't want him to know me and Carlos are cool. So let's just kind of pretend. So he keeps running his mouth to Carlos. He's going to keep running his mouth, running his mouth, running his mouth. I end up finding out that his wife was going to leave him because she found out. He was with my girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, right? She's going to leave him. He got caught. She, the My ex-girlfriend got charged with him. And she's going to leave him. So he's like, you know what? Fuck. She's like, fuck you. I'm leaving. And he's like, fuck you. No, you ain't. I'm going to tell him everything you did. Because she was in the house sometimes when we're counting money. And there's dope there. And she would take a suitcase to the bedroom or something like that, right? She, that's what Cuban wives do. Not a big deal. She went on the street. But shit, when you got $10 million account by hand, because everyone's afraid of a fucking money machine. You believe that? They're afraid of a counting machine. But they'll have 100 kilos. So Because you get extra time for having I mean, that's what a money machine. That's what the theory was. Yeah, you'll get caught. You'll get more time for having the money machine. I never know if that's even true. I think it was a fucking... Yeah, but if you've got a money machine, you're doing big bitch. You're going to get fucking life yeah, anyway. Right. That's what I was thinking. So he tells me that he's taking her down. And if she's going to divorce him, she's going to jail too. This is what this fucker tells me. I said, oh, really? So I called my attorney. I said, hey, tell the feds to come back. I got something to tell them. So they come back and they go, what is it you got to say? And I said, uh, the story about the thing with the, with the girlfriend, you're right. You five, you're 100% right, 100%. And I said, is there anything else you want to ask me? I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, anything else you, you need to know? Because I didn't believe you here. And if, if there's something I can help you with, I want to help you. They go, his wife, tell me what his wife did. Because what he told the feds, about his wife i was there i was in the room they go is, was his wife involved in anything i go his wife no never not his wife i said his wife was i mean she was there at the house she would answer the door she probably knew what was going on right i mean suspect but she was always directed to go stay in her room and not come out till we were done but she never saw dope she never counted money she never did anything ever Ever. I said, I'd love to say so, but I can't put an innocent woman in jail. I said, my time right now, I've already been here three three years or whatever it is. You guys knock knock off. I'll be out in a year. I said, I'd love to tell you that, but no. She never did a damn thing. And you know, one guy smiled like this. He fucking smiled and closed it. And what happened was because he cooperated and there's a they have a little rule. If they catch you lying, all your cooperation goes out the window. All of it, to all the people he told on, even though they got convictions, they got those convictions. Those people pled guilty. They knew they were fucked. They didn't go to trial. All those people he put in jail, he got no credit. He did his whole 20 fucking two years. So he was still cooperating while in prison? All the, because what, what you, you can, so you can do that. What happens I is, I thought once you were sentenced, that's that you're no, fucked. No, no, no. They call you back to go to trial. So let's say I tell on you, right? and you get arrested it could take three years before you go to trial right but in the meantime i'm in prison and i'm doing 20 years when your trial date is ready and you're going to go to go to trial they pull me out of prison i get on the stand like francis and i point the finger he did this and he did that and he did this then they send me back to prison so from that cooperation if they convict you they're going to take my 20 years and knock it to 10. Right, knocked me down to 10. I already did five. I got five left. Mm -hmm. So he did that to eight or nine people. 
He was trying to get, he would have been out in two years. He took down some heavy fucking hitters. In your book as well, there's quite a series of crime, but there's a good ending from that with a boy who was abused by one of the inmates. Oh, that's that was towards the middle of the book. Yeah, that's a dark story. That's a tough one. You want to hear that one? Yeah. That's a tough one. So I was... I was uh, 18 going to... Actually, I had to rewrite it because my wife said this almost made her vomit. I was 18. I just got sentenced, and I was going to prison. I was going up the road. I got sentenced. I got my four years with the recommendation of boot camp and i'm the youngest one me and another kid in there and he's blonde blonde hair blue eyes surfer dude right surfer pretty little surfer and <clears throat> the black dude had come up to me and said something i was like i i knew it i know the game i went with it and then i overheard him say something to another dude about that white you see he goes you see that white boy over there he goes, man, I'm going to get in that pussy tonight. He calls it a pussy, right? I'm going to fuck that little pussy tonight. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this poor son of a bitch is going to get it. So he ends up going next to him and talking to him. Hey, man, how you doing? And I fucking forgot his real name, but I put a bullshit name in the book, Peter or something like that. And... This kid falls for it. He's like, oh, man, how many times have you been? Oh, it's my first time in prison. I've never been before. I'm a little scared. Oh, man, I, I know everybody up the road. You don't have to worry about nothing. I got you. Don't worry. I'm going to get you extra plates. We'll work out together. By the time you get out of here, I'm, you'll be fucking 250 pounds. The girls will be going crazy for you. You just hang out with me, da 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 And this, this kid's like, really? And then he then he starts fucking taking him around. This, this kid's with me, all right? Nobody fuck with this kid. He's with me. He's with me. Now this kid's like, oh fuck, man. I'm like, I'm a John Gotti in the fucking, you know, black dude. I'm thinking, oh my God, you're so fucked. You're so fucked. Then I'm in the cell. Then actually, actually, he gets put in a different cell. He, it's it's me and my cell. And I I I I was in my, by myself. I got one by myself. He got his room and somehow the black dude goes to the white dude and he goes, hey, you want to hang out? You want to go to my room? Because there's two, two bunks. He goes, yeah, but I'm in this room. He goes, no, but if you want, do you want to? If I can get you moved, you can get switched. We can switch to bunkies. He goes, yeah, that will be great. So he goes down and talks to the guard. Another, another black dude from the hood. Hey, man, hook me up here. Switch, switch bunks on us. Switch, switch the bunks on him. So he uh, ends up switching bunks. And I'm sitting there in my room and I can hear, I can hear them bullshitting because you can, you can hear through the air vents. You know, you got the air vents and you can hear pretty clear. And they're going da 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 and he, he jumps, he jumps down off the bed and they're just shooting the shit and he goes, he goes, hey man, uh, I want you to suck my dick. I'm like, I'm thinking. And the kid goes, what? He goes, you heard me, you suck my dick. And he's like, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gay, I'm not gay. And then, the, and then he does a switcheroo on him. He says something like, oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm just kidding. And... Then a, then a fucking crack. And he starts whooping on him. He starts whooping on him. And he ends up starts, he ends up fucking him. He's fucking him. He can hear the kids screaming and screaming and screaming. And he's beating and he gives up. He gives up after a while. He's, he's screaming. At first he's screaming for as long as he can. And he fucks the living dog shit out of this poor fucking bastard. And then... The next morning, the kid comes out and he gives me gives me a letter. He's gonna. He tells me to send his letter to someone. He's gonna he's gonna off himself, right? He's gonna kill himself. 
He wants to send a letter out. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to him, and I said, listen. I said, I know what happened. I said, I heard. I said, what happened? I said, you can't, you can't let that affect, you know, basically I'm trying, trying to come up with words to affect the rest of your life. And, and I said, but you, you, you can, you can do it, get back here. And I says, I said, how much time you got? You got five years. I said, they'll probably let you out of prison. You're probably going to get out of prison on this. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, the, the, you need to get this guy in a, in a vulnerable position. And then he had a shank. There was a shank somewhere. No, it was under the guy's pillow. The kid didn't have one, but the guy had him. So he, I think he went and took his shank. That's the guy who always slept with the shank, went and took a shank. And I said, listen, take this fucker upstairs, pull his fucking pants down to his knees, down to his ankles, do what you got to do, and shove that fucking shank right between his, where the taint is, you know what the fucking taint is? I shoved that fucking thing up there and just go to work on him, just go to work on him, and then hit the buzzer and go to the hospital. Because he's been raped. He's got fucking evidence all over the place. He's like, what? I said, just do it, man. Just go, just play the game. Babe. Play the game. Don't come in like this sad shit. Play the fucking game. Pretend it never happened. Go sit next to him, da-da-da. Shoot the shit. Make the move. Hey, tap him on the shoulder. Hey, let's go upstairs, da-da-da. And bam, he did it. That fucking guy screamed like you've never heard. You know, man, that must have hurt. What's, the, what's your biggest regret in life? regret with that life you're involved with well there was one I, I would say none because the whole th everything I did led me up to going also going to Japan meeting my wife and having my child so if you if 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 I was to change one piece of any part of my life, would that have still happened? No. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have to, you know, but when, you, when you have a daughter, you got kids, right? Yeah. Boy, girl? Both. Okay, so, I mean, if, if there was one thing, you know, when people say I regret or what would I change, if changing that, what if that changed your whole life? What if it changes where you are right now? No regrets. I've seen a few videos where you call it, like, kind of calling out Sam and the Bull. Yeah. How come? Well, at first, he, he, you know, he's a, he's a gang. He was a gangster at one time. But then you get on YouTube and these people say what's, he's just not true. And he's not this. It wasn't as, as much as Sammy the Bull was the problem. It was everyone else. Oh, he's this, he's that. He can do this, he can do that. He's still in the life. He's still da da da. He's a gangster. He'll shoot you. He'll kill you. Doesn't matter how old he is. And it was all going on and on and on and on. So as a joke, it wasn't a joke. I would have been serious. I would have went. But he was, he's an old man. What's he going to do? And he's in hiding. But I actually called my mob friends and I said, hey, I got a really good idea. I said, I'm going to call out Sam the Bull. And if he says yes, to Central Park. So you know how much fucking money we'll make? They go, are you kidding me? You're going to call him out on... I said, yeah. Imagine if he says, yeah, I'll be there. They go, we want the whole venue. <coughs> the venue's ours. So, but he never replied. So the only... The, what it was was showing people that he's not this... He's in hiding. He's He, he might have been tough at one time. He didn't kill all these people that he thinks he did. He killed one or two. Killed a boy, young boy, 15. Shot him in the face. Ax I don't know if it was an accident, but no one talks about that. Right? You heard that story, right? What so, was the story? There was some, I think, I think he whacked somebody or beat somebody, and then the kid was there and he shot him just because he was there. Simple. So, I mean, stupid, stupid shit. But. The beef with Sam and the Bull was it was nonsense. I don't have a beef with him. And had he shown up, 
I would have probably just said, you know, you got some balls because unless he had a gun, what's he going to do? He's old, I mean, he's an old man. I would never go after someone older than, you know, old. Where do you go forward for the future? Oh, I have no idea. Do you miss the old life? Uh, do yeah. You? I, I can't, <laughs> I can't you miss it? I can't lie. The best, <laughs> best times of my life were in Japan. Japan was just, Florida was good, but Japan was the laws. The laws, I mean, you get Florida, you're like this, you're scared, you know? You know something, you're the, the fucking technology. But when I heard about the laws in Japan, if it's not on you, in your hands, I mean, it's like, wow, that's, so, you know, like Tate said, that's why the conviction rate's so high. If they got you, they fucking got you. Speaking of Tate, you mind if I say something right? Of course you can. Originally, I'm, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm guilty of finger fucking the phone and, and scrolling, right? We all are. I, I could, one time I couldn't stop. <laughs> I was like, this is the best entertainment in the world. Yeah. 15 seconds of uh, shorts, and, and then I run across this guy, and I'm like, who's this dickhead? The fuck would he? And I just didn't like him, you know? But I, I watched not long. I just only had to hear 10 seconds, and that's it, right? Then I hear he gets in trouble, right? He's got this pending case. So then I watch your video because I'm trying to catch your accent and it's him. So while I'm listening to both of you, I'm listening to his story. So then I'm, he explains his, his charge is human trafficking and how he explained it was absurd. What, what, what they're calling human trafficking if in Romania, from what I understood, was that he spoke to some girls and convinced them to do webcam. And in exchange, they gave him some money and they kept a little bit of it. Something to that effect, right? They weren't prisoners, right? They could have left whenever they wanted. Yeah, the CCTV of them leaving and going back. And right, so and trafficking in, in the U.S. Yeah. is actually, you possess somebody. They go and work for you and they come back and they cannot leave. That is like you, you know, you've 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 got them to where they're stuck. That's human trafficking. You take point A, you work for me. What he did was more on the line of being a like a, a pimp. Uh, uh, yeah, he's admitted that though. Like a, like a pimp. Yeah, he admitted that. That's that's not human. to me. It's but Romania may call that human trafficking. Yeah, yeah. They may, right? Yeah, yeah. For me, is I think human trafficking is kids chained to wall, chained to walls, and beaten up. But yeah, there must be. Obviously, I don't know the rules and regulations with it. Even, listen, if you're working for a boss and they tell you you're staying late tonight or you better be in fucking work today, mm -hmm. what sort is that? Mm -hmm. Trafficking, that's sort of, he's tr they're trying to make out he controlled them or whatever bullshit it is, but there's fuck all against them with all the charges will be dropped. Yeah. But he just gets so high profile. It's, it's you know, here's what, <laughs> here's what I got a little nervous for him. And, you know, he says, he says he's not, he doesn't, it was never a criminal, and by listening to him, I could I could say, I don't, he, he doesn't seem like a criminal. Doesn't have the criminal mind. He has a different type of mind. Because when he says these things, I'm thinking, mm -mm, not good. That wasn't good. Shouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. That's gonna hurt you. Um, he he got on a phone call while he was locked up, and it was something about going to the doctors overseas, and for some sort of cancer treatment, yeah, something like that, right? Yeah. So. And then when he went in front of the judge, they altered the phone call. Remember that? Mm -hmm. They altered the phone call. And I thought, mm, if they altered a phone call for something so small, do you know what they're gonna do when he goes to trial? Yeah. That's what he's got, that's what he's got to really watch out for, is look at, at what they did to that fucking phone call. It could all be bullshit, but it, what they can be in the background He's going to go to trial and go, oh, my God, I didn't see this coming. But if they want you, they'll get you. That's you it. Yeah. If that's what I'm saying. That's If they want you, they get you. If I was him, my move would be, I got two moves if I was him. One, you better start contacting everyone you can in the Romanian prisons. Everyone. Every gangster. Everybody. Because when you go there, I don't care how much money you have or who you are, you are fucked. 
Even in the States, there's some of these big, these guys get brought in from Colombia, right? These cartel bosses. And when they get there, they think, ah, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're not anymore. Free game. You're fucked, man. You've, yeah. got, you, you've got these guys in there that triple life sentences with no money. You're, gonna, you're paying them now. You know, you're paying everybody X amount to keep you alive. So if, if I was him, I would be I would be definitely searching out who's who, who's in, char in charge of which prison. Is there any way to be sent to a certain prison and, and start organizing that? So day one, when he gets there, there's no trying to figure shit out. Yeah. That would be my first thing. My second one is, depending on how much money you got, if, if they went after him that way, there's two sides of the coin. There's dirty prosecutors. Get dirt on people. Get dirt on people. Because with the amount of money he's got, there's a lot of dirt out there that, you know, I would be, I would be just going after them, going after them. And hopefully, you know, you might find one of these fucking guys visits a porn site and bam, you got him. You know? You're convicting me, you're trying to charge me on this, and you go to porn sites all the time and you're watching kids. Well, case dismissed. <laughs> I mean, that, that would be my my mentality, but mostly uh, you know, being prepared that if he has to go to prison, that, that would be it. For anybody watching that's maybe wanting to get involved in a life of crime, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for them? Unless you want to go to prison or die it's there's really you're gonna get caught it's in almost listen we used to get away when we were kids we could get away right you can't get away with anything now you, you just can't it's so the technology is is so advanced i mean they can listen to you from egypt you know they got this onstar in the car they don't have to, they just turn on onstar and listen to every conversation we have you know it's it's if you put your mind if you're going to put your mind into drugs, now listen, there's some kids that it's, and, and it's sad. There's some kids in the fucking America that have no choice. They're, they, they're in a bad neighborhood. They got, they don't know who their father is. The government sure the fuck isn't helping them. And, and the, the school system they're in is garbage. Even if they graduated, they, you know, they can't read. They graduate, okay? It's got all these things against them no matter what. And what do you do when you don't have the same exact resources someone else does, you know, 500 miles away? Mm -hmm. There are some kids that just, that is going to be, that, uh, unfortunately, that's going to be the their destination. Just try to, you know, you can teach them how to do it, but. It's sad. For anybody that's what to buy your book, how can they get your book? Amazon. Amazon's the easiest way. And it, would you like to finish up on anything else? Nah, I think we're... You got anything else? No, I'm good, mate. That was a good three and a half hour session. You was it? Yeah, you took on a journey. You're a very good speaker. So, yeah, I think people will enjoy this, man. Oh, okay. Anthony, listen for coming on today and telling your story. You I thoroughly enjoyed you. I wish you all the best for the future. Okay. God bless you. Take care.